let us have a fearful debate yes and healthy one of course namrata don't you are muted i think you can come we are live uh we welcome all of you for our arc webinar on challenging debate series the essence of the webinar was to thrash out some very relevant controversies and get better informed in the process with the very best of speakers who are geared against each other today we are delighted as always to have the very best of expert panel on stage our president dr mahipal sachdev our honorary secretary dr namrita sharma our irsi chairman arc dr gaurav lutra our very dear past president dr debashish bhattacharya and dr srinivas a member arc south would be moderating along with me without ado let's start with the first set of debaters so get ready debaters dr gopal pillai the southern invincible hero from kerala is going great guns in the posterior segment and dr rajesh sinha a honorary treasurer aios could beat the very best at any point of time the topic of debate is most relevant and debatable scleral fixated aios should be in the domain of vr surgeon as against anterior segment surgeons to be equally proficient here we go starting with you dr gopal pillai thank you very much ma'am can you see my screen yes yes sir yeah so uh, my time starts now yes yeah scleral fixed iol should remain in the domain of vitreoretinal surgeons what is what i am speaking about i have no financial interest i believe that anyone can learn anything and the typical example is professor dr rajesh sinha who was my senior who was trained in cornea but joined as an assistant professor in retina before he came back into the anterior segment to be what he is right now but when you are looking at a procedure like a scleral fixated eye oil to be given to all cataract surgeons even china talks about medical ethics now what does scleral fixation entail it is about putting a intraocular lens just behind the plane of the iris and fixed at the scleral region now let us look at some of the statistics of retinal detachment out of 100 cases 42 rds occur after cataract surgery and trauma which are the cases which sf eye oil is being done Dr Rajesh's own statistics from RP center says that 63 percentage of pseudophagic retinal detachment occurs for PC rens and sulcus eye oils which are basically the cases in which SFI oil needs to be done RD is 30 times higher in cases with lattice without PVD which are the younger patients with trauma in which SFI oil is done a population based study 11500 retinal detachments trauma 16 times risk of RD 12 times risk higher with vitreous loss 20 times it is not 20 percentage it is 20 times so you understand why is there a 20 percent 20 times 30 times increased risk is basically because you touch this particular area right behind the iris plane called the vitreous base and the vitreous base is very tightly adherent to this area and even if the rest of the pvd occurs the vitreous base uh, uh, is the culprit which if you manipulate like when you put a blunt instrument like an intraocular lens into that place partial pvd total pvd retinal tear retinal detachment occurs so in a basic surgical principles there are few principles first do no harm infrastructure and instrumentation should be adequate the surgeon should have adequate training and the surgeon should be able to perform evaluate and manage pre intra and post operative problems so let's look at them one by one first do no harm it's already a compromised cornea and that's why you were not able to put an eye oil in the first place it's an fake any problem in the pars plana pars plicata vitreous hemorrhage vitreous base if you have any problem abnormal vr traction cystoid macular edema epiretinal membrane retinal detachment end of thalamide is lot of problems is the surgeon adequately trained to handle all this so retinal surgeon is trained in ophthalmology and cataract surgery but cataract surgeon is not trained in managing problematic abnormal vitreous why is that the surgical retina training is not part of ms md curriculum is because blinding complications occur after a single mistake So when the cataract volume is high, we can train MSPGs. But SFI oils as well as retinal surgery volume is very low, and training opportunities are so low. So better managed by someone who knows how to handle anterior segment and abnormal vitreous. Now, can the surgeon evaluate pre-op problems like peripheral vitreoretinal traction, which is a 
a transparent uh, three dimensional issue and an indirect ophthalmoscope or vitreous base partial pvd all these the retinal surgeon needs to look at it what about intraop problems any bleed will cause immediate vitreous hemorrhage there is no pc peripheral retinal traction and tear any vitreous base avulsion any central uh, vitreomacular traction dropped iol the cataract surgeon cannot manage all this what about post operative issues vitreous hemorrhage to peripheral tear to rd to dropped iol to erm vmt and end of thalmitis now let us look at shankar netralaya statistics from south india post op retinal complications were seen in 1 by 5th of patients with sfiol 20% of patients and these retinal complications in the post operative period a cataract surgeon cannot manage policy making is basically depend on a risk benefit analysis and the number of sfiols required to be used in the country is not large enough so that all cataract surgeons need to be proficient in that procedure adequate people needs to be trained it's not about finances it's going to left. it's going to be faster it's going to be slower it's going to be uh, more uh, not so common it you require a vitrectomy machine you require a good cutter so the finances are not the problem why should a cataract surgeon do it i feel it's the ego factor and i i i think that many of the cataract surgeons who are in this panel they would have forgotten the last time they got a pc rent and faced a vitreous it's face saving it's not safe whenever in doubt you put your dad as the patient would you want a cataract surgeon there or would you want a vitreous retinal surgeon who can also do some cataract surgery so that he can manage the vitreous base sfiol requires both cataract and retinal surgery skills but you know you have to choose wisely it's an already complicated eye and it's a more complicated than usual surgery it's not a stereotype procedure i think we have to think about safety first and not i can also do so scleral fixated iols should remain in the domain of vitreo retinal surgeons and if he was a general surgeon my friend professor dr rajesh sinha would have said i want to do vaginal hysterectomy thank you thanks up thanks dr gopal that was a, a very good punch you gave dr rajesh i'm sure you have a good counter for that yeah uh, i would just share my slides uh at the outset i would like to thank dr chitra for giving me the opportunity and uh, you know i would also like to thank dr gopal pillai who you know gave some points which were really uh, you know uh, strange actually so uh, let me first uh, speak about why i should uh, why i think that it should be sfil should be in the domain of uh, anterior segment surgeon because you go back to history go back to people who have done great work in the field of sfil it was enric malbran in 1986 who gave the concept of transconjunctival uh, 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 scleral fixation of iol and what was he if you just see the literature he was a very good cornea surgeon he has publications in ophthalmology in very great journals in the field of cornea like bilateral and unilateral penetrating keratoplasty corneal dystrophies and keratoconus and this malbran is the person who is behind the concept of transcleral suture fixation of iol and then after 1986 a lot of modification a lot of innovations have been done and most of these innovations have been done by anterior segment surgeons and the technique of sfiol became more popular during 2004 2005 or 6 when this gentleman who is considered as the pioneer in microincision cataract surgery dr amar agarwal who popularized the technique of uh, sfiol or the glued iol and he has many publications in this uh, direct in this uh, uh, field dr priya narang who is an anterior segment surgeon has done quite a path breaking research in this i have also a few drops in the ocean of the research of sfiol and uh, i can tell you i am primarily an anterior segment surgeon and i was allowed to do scleral fixation of iol in the retina unit when i was posted for a short period with dr gopal was telling because i was primarily an anterior segment surgeon and all the residents most of the residents if not all have been trained under me at rp center which is the biggest residency program in the country so uh, there is no doubt a debate that an anterior segment surgeon is more well versed with iol the sfiol technique understanding of iol nuances of iol and uh, Gopal was telling that think about your dad. I would say think about your colleagues, your fellow doctors who will be more complaining. I have done SFIL in uh, close to ten doctors, and 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 
So the basic thing, I was just thinking that why Gopal is telling that, you know, the posterior segment surgeon should be doing this technique and why so many people, you know, few people attach SFI with uh, retina surgeons because most of these cases have some, or some of these cases have some dropped nucleus or dropped eye or some complications. And these complications are better managed by VR surgeon. There's no doubt about it. So vitreous management, a complete vitrectomy can be done by a VR surgeon very nicely, lift up the IOL and the anterior segment surgeon says that, okay, you just fix that IOL, whatever way you can do it, go ahead and finish it up. And so that I am free of the patient. So that is how the VR surgeon started having connection with the SF IOL. Now just think about the steps of the glued IOL technique and you can yourself imagine that whether anterior segment surgeon is more well-versed with this or a posterior segment surgeon. You do a small peritomy first, which is better done by anterior segment surgeon, does pterygium surgery, does conjunctival flaps and corneal ulcers, et cetera. No retina surgeon does it. You do a lamellar dissection of sclera to create a scleral flap. That is also done by a cornea and anterior segment surgeon better than retina surgeon doesn't do it. Small anterior vitrectomy is required, not the total vitrectomy which a retina surgeon does. And that can be done through the anterior root or through the posterior root as well. And the, the pulling technique of, you know, the pulling of the vitreous from the anterior chamber uh, to do the small amount of vitrectomy in the PCRs has been described by an anterior segment surgeon and that is Dr. Abhay Vasavada and not by a retina surgeon. IOL loading, injection, haptic holding, exteriorization, tucking in- 60 seconds. In just yeah, intraspinal groove can all be better done by uh, by an anterior segment surgeon than a retina surgeon. And wound closer, of course, corneal wound closer is done by a anterior segment surgeon only. And fibrin glue, of course, is used in pterygium, etc. So all these steps are better done by anterior segment surgeon. This study, which was published in Retina, states that in eyes with SFI, well, wherein PPV was done in comparison to anterior vitrectomy, there was more myopic shift and higher rate of IOL optic capture. So a retina surgeon only is claiming that. So in conclusion, I think the debates are done when there is some ambiguity. There is absolutely no ambiguity that the finesse that an anterior segment surgeon has to control the IOL is definitely better. Uh, uh, and a VR surgeon is definitely more proficient in doing a full vitrectomy. And if there's a complication like a drop diol or nucleus, but if there's a routine FA for SFIOL, anterior segment surgeon is the one to whom one should approach. And lastly, I would <laughs> like to say that Gopal, you were telling that in Shankar Nikrale, there are quite a large number of complications after SFIOL, and all these are done by retina surgeons. You take the data of RP center, the complications are much less because it is mainly done by anterior segment surgeon. And lastly, but not the least, uh, uh, I was just, I had just noted one more point that uh, it is not that only in post RD or post uh, vitrectomy patients or only in the complicated eyes that the SFIL is done. A routine FA also comes to you for so many reasons, the IOL is not put. And in such scenarios, it is the anterior segment surgeon who should be approached. And I am pretty sure that everybody uh, will agree with the, these logic. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All of both of them have done well. Dr. Gopal, don't give up your last chance to rebuttal Rajesh. Am I audible? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So first thing Rajesh told about history, I think as far as he thinks, uh, reminiscence of the barber surgeons are better than the surgeons now. So a second thing he told that there were a lot of innovations because of anterior segment surgeons. The anterior surgeons, anterior segment surgeons required innovations because the previous models were not good and it created more and more complications. And that is why more and more innovations had and techniques had been there. Now, retinal surgeons were historically more, they had more work in the vitreous in terms of uh, retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, all those things. And that is why we did not focus on this particular area, which, uh, which that is why probably not a lot of work initially in the historical event. But now, uh, he, Dr. Rajesh Sinha tells about his good results in 10 doctors. I'm, I have no doubt that Dr. Rajesh Sinha is an excellent surgeon. If my dad requires, Rajesh Sinha will be the surgeon. But we are thinking about cataract surgeons across the length and breadth of India, which is a huge number, whether they will be trained adequately. 
com some complications he said it's 20 percentage it's it's not just in shankar netrale for information it's all over scleral flap we do a scleral flap and keep an encerclage inside so scleral flap is not a we do a scleral flap to drain so scleral flap peritomy all these are routine work so what is critical here is the vitreous what is critical here is the any abnormality of the vitreous can cause a permanently debilitating blindness in this patient so the risk of one side permanent blindness versus the other side some refractive error because the lens was not placed what is critical i think the judges can decide dr rajesh doctor um, 30 seconds the yeah. critical point is vitreous i completely agree with dr gopal but we don't have to do a complete vitrectomy we just have to do a little bit of vitrectomy which can better be done by anterior segment surgeons who routinely do if there is a pcr and it can be done through a parsimonial route described by an anterior segment surgeon that is dr bhai vasavara so uh, rajesh was chris dr maipal we look forward to your comments i think you are muted yeah i think this is a debate just for the sake of a debate i think ultimately it depends on the comfort level of an individual surgeon after all uh, there is a particular level of skill and training that is required for any form of surgery and if an anterior segment surgeon who used to do anterior vitrectomy is uh, able to do these uh, uh, surgeries well i think there is nothing stopping him and uh, in case he feels that he is not comfortable he should pass it on to the vr surgeon now there are rajesh is sitting here i can see shri ganesh here uh, uh, he does uh, a lot of these cases etc and for one if i have to do i will i always have my retina people and uh, instead of um, having uh, to kind of uh, start doing a particular thing i'll pass it on to the retina surgeon so i think everyone has to be uh, very very careful about one's own skill levels and if you do not have the adequate skill you should not do it after all uh, we used to be just ophthalmologist and ophthalmology has then been subdivided at certain uh, institutions into subdivisions while still there are comprehensive ophthalmologists who can do a little bit of everything so at the end i think the patient whether it's your dad or your colleague or anybody should be the uh, most important thing and you have to live with your own own conscience and your own uh, skill sets that are there so you should not venture as an experiment uh and uh, i think uh, either of the two if they are adapt to do it uh, they should be able to do it but uh, take your call and your it's your judgment call as to what it has to be done because it has a little bit of both okay so on to you dr srinivas i think we'll go on to the uh, second case dr mahipal has clearly put across the right choice by the right surgeon yeah. dr srinivas yeah uh, thank you madam uh, good evening everyone so after a spirited and acrimonious debate by the two great giants in ophthalmology so let's move on to our next team is dr himanshu mehta uh, premium cataract surgeon who has the best of the mumbaikers at his doorsteps when i say best of the mumbaikers it includes amitabh bachchan as well and he is fighting against another doyan dr satyajit sinha who presently is a member of arc east zone but in futuristic probably a chief minister of bihar so when i say as a minister who clearly knows about winning the bread so the topic of the debate is the premium surgeries is the way to go against the fortune lies at the bottom of the pyramid over to dr himanshu sir please thank you dr shrinivas wonderful to be here in this podium and speak to everyone i would say the topic given to his premier surgery is the way to go but i would quote dr mahipal just a minute back when he said that there is nothing premium about premium evolution of science and technology and meeting patient needs and expectation and what you can give them so that they can see very well in this world is the need of the hour we don't we talk premium with respect to money there is no money involved in science and technology science and technology will be at the forefront of human life in the years to come this is was said by albert einstein in 1944 we'll see how important it is that it is nothing to do with premium all this is a necessity innovation was never a premium it is it is a necessity now let's see how the world progressed across in every field we are not talking about luxuries we are talking about how science evolved how we moved from the dabba phone to the cell phone it's not a luxury anymore the smartphone gives you so much life has changed so much there's so much innovation there is so much of answers into that and this is what i'm trying to tell you that there's nothing premium about premium what used to be premium is now a necessity at every given point of time now over the years we have comp we have told patients and over promised them no injection are kuch nahi no injection no pain no patti are fatta kal office ja sakta hai 
कल सब दिखेगा व्हाट्सएप भी दिखेगा सो नाउ पेशेंट बाय इवनिंग इफ दे कैन रीड देयर व्हाट्सएप दे आर गोइंग टू किल यू दैट डे लुक योर सर्जरी हैज गॉन नाउ नाउ द मनी डजंट कम प्लीज डोंट मिसअंडरस्टैंड इवन इफ इट्स अ मोनोफोकल फ्री चैरिटेबल हॉस्पिटल पेशेंट ही एक्सपेक्ट्स इट इज बर्थ राइट आफ्टर कैटरैक्ट सर्जरी दैट ही शुड सी एवरीथिंग सो वी आर कॉट इन आवर ओन वेब इन द बिग टॉक्स ओवर द इयर्स एंड फॉर्चूनेटली साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी हैज हेल्प्ड अस टू गो अहेड and go further and health and vision there is no scope of a compromise there is no premium element in this is it a necessity i dislike the word premium now look at this picture is this what you want on the left side or is the right side more important it's absolutely grass is free vision is that a luxury is it a premium not at all it is a necessity so look at the technology we have seen a fake glasses once upon a time is that what you want for people by saying that no 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 this is premium not giving giving them glasses is a, not a premium come on let's let's walk into the modern world ecc 180 degrees with stitches and huge 180 degrees you know against the rule astigmatism of 3 degrees plus is this considered premium no it is a necessity so absolutely nothing was a premium at all you know in your in your car you have that uh, roller car you used to have that is not a necessity and now here look at that we as ophthalmologists you know we just discussed you have the anterior segment surgeon you have the glaucoma surgeon you have the retina surgeon you mean to say somebody spent 10 years and put in retina surgery and glaucoma or oculoplasty they are premium no it's a necessity of the need of the hour whoever is more qualified to give the best to the patient you know what happens friends as doctors we have undersold ourselves the word premium comes from these multinational companies who want to sell the lenses you know when we started with lenses ultraviolet was a big thing they used to charge us for that then they used to charge us for putting a achromatosphere then achromatic lenses then aspherical lenses now tell me is it not a birthright of a patient would you use a spherical lenses today aspherical toric lenses square edge technology four foldable lenses hydrophobic now if money put on one side is it not the need of the hour is it not what we need for every patient yes we'll progress to preloaded lenses tomorrow is this a great amount of uh, premium not at all why did they not give it to us well their fault and we always accepted very coolly we kept on doing our education very well but none of us ever said that we were premium surgeons we all were humble human beings and the pharma sold it to us as premium they said nahi 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 this is premium so make more money so their profit was 10000 times this is where we now you have a astigmatic patient now why you what are you going to do in an astigmatic patient will you use a toric lens or you will just use a regular lens yeah sure but if you have a toric lens available why wouldn't you is that premium not at all it's an indicated surgery 60 so, seconds sir yeah, yeah right i'll be right so laparotomy you know today the laparotomy and laparoscopy it's a no brainer that if you don't you want a small incision micro incision surgery is the way to go next slide so the point is life is a matter of perception what eventually science and technology wins what we want is the ultimate thing for the patient that what we want all patients to say look at this how are you feeling fantastic i am so happy and i say i am the happiest person on the earth yes friend this is what we want from patient this is not premium this is exactly what we have done all our life training for to give them the best we train for 30 years this is not premium and we are not charging any premium for that the premium word was introduced by the pharma let's put it on one side its technology updates in science and how we put our technology and surgical skills to give the, give the best to the patients i leave this to my opponent now uh thank you sir thanks sir uh, sina sir you have a tough job to do now <laughs> so let's hear you out beating your opponent go ahead please Do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good evening to all of you. I have been given the topic of fortune lies in the bottom of the pyramid. My worthy opponent uh, has spoken just now, Dr. Himanshu, and he showed the picture of a plane. And the debate is here whether a business class is a must or not. The debate is whether you actually need an iPhone 11 or a not um, uh, iPhone uh, for a cell phone. now vision 2020 was one of the questions which we used to get in our community of ophthalmology question and it turns out that we didn't have a vision of 2020 at all of what was going to happen in 2020 we have all fallen on our face in this covid times and propagating premium iol is going to make matters worse as regards reduction in the incidence of preventable blindness we took the hippocratic oath serve the humanity but if we are going to propagate premium iols i am not sure if how much of the humanity we can serve there is one thing in covid times that it has taught us we have to respect what is required most and not what is a luxury
cataract means different to different people for some it is fine print is important for some view of the field of the in the village is good enough now india is the largest consumer of iuls in the world and the premium iuls are a fraction of it population of nearly 1.5 billion now and we have to think about everybody we cannot think about a select few and the number of cataract surgeons that we have are limited to less than about 10000 India is home to one third of the world's blind population, and how can you talk only about premium IULs and the alert, elite? One of the statements that Sir said in the big, in the middle was, "Money put to one side. Money cannot be put to one side because it is one of the most important things." What Dr. Srinivas is saying, Sir is treating the who's who in uh, Maharashtra, but more than 50 percent of the population of Maharashtra lives in rural area with. agriculture as their main occupation so monofocal is the way to go for india the cost of sics is about 20 dollars whereas if you are going to do uh, flax in a clinic with the like dr himanshu it's anywhere between more than 500 dollars so premium iuls are a luxury for privileged few what you see on the top is what india is and they cannot afford the trifocal iul that you see below now we cannot just go behind running behind and uh, copy what they are doing in the west we have to have our own um, uh, system of reducing the incidence of blindness indeed fortune is uh, lies at the base of the pyramid my submission is not against the science of the premium iuls which sir was saying it's about but its implementation in the country of 1.5 billion people progress is not about science is all about science but it should not have a road roller effect on our common masses Let's talk about the turnover of Arvind Eye Hospital, Disha Eye Hospital. Doctor uh, Devashish Bhattacharya is sitting in the panel. Doctor Sita Pur Eye Hospital, Chitrakoot. I'll just tell you, leave alone how much you are making money uh, in in the premium IOL sector. Disha Eye Hospital is has invested in the past few years hundred crores in West Bengal, and they have a module for it. Arvind Eye Hospital. It reaches out to all the and. Uh, reaches out and serves to all those who are in need. Arvind Eye Care started as a 11 bedded eye hospital, and now they have seen over 40 million patients. Unbelievable! And what they do not be, uh, depend on donors. Their net profit, and this is from a few years back, was eight million dollars. Forget about changing it to rupees. Uh, I I will lose count. But this was in 2010. I must. I think it must be 15 million dollars now. over and above all that when you have all, when you have to put premium iuls you have to put in manpower you have to put counselors and counseling for all these things and then you have to deliver that that burden is on the patient and over and above that the surgeon also has a lot of burden in buying pentacam iul master 700 and for the rest of his life he will keep returning all the emis in the bank 60 After seconds all that you have done you still have to tell the patient that there will be halos glare there may be short uh, there may be contrast uh, decrease so on and so forth it is much more difficult to manage refractive surprise in patients with premium iuls as their expectations are very high and then you have a list of uh, things where you cannot put these premium iuls with uh, those who have ocular surface disease keratoconus monofocal iuls those who have low endothelial cell count macular disease diabetic retinopathy patients who have unrealistic expectations and those who have issues with the weak donules who the angle kappa is more in pediatric patient in small pupils in patients who have uh, had refractive surgery and those are the patients in future who are going to come more to our clinics and just a food for thought though in all those young patients who are who we are putting the multifocal and bifocal after 30 to 40 years all these patients god forbid if they have armd or corneal pathologies how will this trifocal and mono Thanks, and multifocal act Uh, is something that we should be thinking about or will it be the monofocal patients who will fare better thank you so much for your patience here uh thank you sinha sir imanshu sir yes candidate yes, candidate and the universal thoughts of uh, dr sinha so your rebuttal please yes sir he just spoke exactly for me fortune lies so he kept talking about money you know, by vertical integration of arvin they have made more money than a premium iul surgeon can ever think of doing because he is using science technology to give the best to the patient he is spending money from his bloody pocket to see that the patient sees well every point disha out of 100 crore will make 500 crores and i will lose money because i give the equipment supplier makes money that's what friends i'm trying to tell you as surgeons we are walking into a wrong dead trap of saying that fortune it's not the fortune i'm not talking about money let's talk of science we are talking only about 
progress and evolution. So giving the best to the patient, which is his birthright, should be the basic thing that we are looking at. Toric IOL, multifocal, it's immaterial. Glasses, free vision, toric, and seeing very well in this life for the rest of their life. And sir, for, for that matter, a multifocal with a, a cost lens would give rise to a telescopic lens for an ARMD patient. This is, I would wind up, thank you for speaking for me, that the, exactly in trying to have the volume game, we are trying to make more money. I'm not looking at money, sorry. Uh, thank you, sir. What is exactly thank, thing. thank you, Sina, sir. Get the money because tomorrow, if I tell him to do a premium IOL surgery for twenty dollars, he will not be able to do it. And we are talking about one point five billion people, and how many of them can afford going to Dr. Himanshu for a premium IOL surgery? If sir reduces his cost to twenty dollars, I will accept defeat in this debate. Half a second, half a second. Friends, it is not a fight between doctors. Unfortunately, if you all get together and tell and force the pharma to give the right kind of substance to us at the regular rate, you know, like the PMM lens, which used to cost a bomb earlier on, if we can get all lenses at that rate, if we fight with them and give it to us, we'll give our patients the best. Thank you so much. So after the parliamentary fight between the two, the big guns, I think Dibasi sir was slightly confused. Was this topic on the premium surgeries or on Disha? <laughs> anyway, it's a good point. We made both of you. So, uh, I would like to, Namrata, madam, your thoughts, please. I How would you like uh, to Just like uh, Dr. Maipal sir said that there is no debate, I would also like to say the same thing uh, in the sense that uh, primarily it is determined by the affordability of the patient. So, if the patient is able to afford it and if the patient uh, wants to have premium myel surgeries, then that is the way to go. And now, because Everybody is so much net, net savvy, you know, they've already Googled everything and they will come and tell you they want it. Uh, having said this, there is another set of patients who cannot afford or who can afford less, shouldn't say cannot afford. And probably if given an option and if, uh, if they are able to afford it or like NHS in UK, you make everything paid by the government. I'm sure all of them would, you know, want to uh, go in for premium intraocular lenses and nobody will say then that, you know, they are okay with the monofocals or whatever. So I think it is all about affordability. It is more about patients than about us doctors. It is about their pockets and less about our pockets. And from our side, it is our convincing ability, how much we can convince them. Thank you, Thank you madam. madam. Over to Chitra, madam, please. Now we shall go on to our next team, which is quite an awe-inspiring team. We have our Bangalore Prince Charming, uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, against... A Coimbatore man to be reckoned, Dr. Ramurthy. And they have a, a real debatable uh, score here. Immediate simultaneous cataract surgery against sequential being in the interest of the patient. Don't you think the air is sizzling already? Mm -hmm. So, Sri Ganesh, we are looking forward to what you have to say. Reasonable or unreasonable is what Ramurthy would decide. Good evening, dear friends. And... Uh... I would like to thank the ARC for giving me this opportunity. Are my slides visible? Is it clear? Oops, sorry. Uh, let me just, uh, it's just running, okay. Okay, uh, so let us start. My topic today is immediate simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery. And uh, I have no financial interest, but a lot of interest in this uh, uh, topic and uh, in today's time, uh, COVID times, let us look at what is the news. The latest uh, conference, the biggest conference was the virtual uh, uh, ASCRS, which happened. And then the ocular surgery just uh, news just reported this, uh, that surgeons should consider offering immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery. And there was a talk by uh, Huck Holtz, uh, cornea specialist at Kaiser Permanente, uh, from California, and he said immediate uh, sequential bilateral cataract surgery results in half as many operating room and office appointments when compared with traditional delayed uh, surgery, uh, and it requires less personal protective equipment for staff. Um, so the cost saving because of the PPEs is much more, the lower cost to the clinic, and leads to less crowded practice uh, parking lots and waiting room. So in today's world, especially we will have to consider immediate uh, bilateral cataract surgery. Let us look at the benefits. First, let us look at the benefit to the patient. Suppose you are using general anesthetic, then whether it's an adult or pediatric case, then with one anesthetic, you can complete the surgery on both eyes. 
and there was a problem giving a block because if you give a block in both eyes then that was the thinking before but today most cases of cataract are done under topical anesthesia so bilateral cataract surgery is fine with the patient and then the patient to be uh, recovers immediate so immediate Im improved visual function also uh, is one of the uh, benefits one step visual rehabilitation and there's no anisometropia between operations for patients uh, who have refractive errors and you can just prescribe one pair of new glasses uh, two to three weeks after the surgery bilateral surgery you don't have to keep changing the glasses and lesser number of post operative visits so less crowding in the opd and less cost to the patient to the hospital the advantages there is only one pre assessment visit there's only one admission for surgery so this reduces the time it reduces the amount of ppe and it uh, also improves the efficiency in the operation theater and it's more efficient use of the opd and clinic to the society at large shorter waiting list for surgery uh, and clinics because many of the uh, countries like uh, uk and all that they have large waiting lists so this will cut down their waiting list like anything and accompanying friends and relatives need not take off uh, time again and again it's uh, less demand on hospital transport services now we actually we provide transport to patients who want cataract surgery and uh, this really helps because in covid times especially when there is difficulty in uh, transportation coming to convenience and cost reduction in medical visits contribute to the convenience factor and cost savings so the patients also are more for it and older patients may have to arrange for caregivers they may have their children to take off from work and the need for two surgeries doubles the expenses to the caregivers and caregivers actually prefer that it be done uh, uh, immediately and then there is also a publication by arshan of that uh, comparing immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery versus delayed surgery and the uh, potential hospital uh, uh, cost savings and they found that there was a 32.4% reduction if you do bilateral simultaneous cataract surgeries which is a huge chunk um, of money and uh, levo's estimate uh, when he mathematically calculated uh, globally if uh, bilateral cataract surgery is done uh, with a ratio of uh, sequential surgery 1 is to 1 even 1 is to 1 you will have a saving of 100 billion us dollars which is a huge amount and especially in today's time with the global recession economic recession this is a huge amount 100 billion Mr. dollars seconds. is a huge amount and visual uh, function uh, stereopsis is disrupted in the time between the two cataract surgery and uh, when eyes continue to function monocularly patients lose depth perception visual rehabilitation is delayed and there's a paper also which says that if you do sequential surgery it takes 4 months for the second eye to recover whereas with immediate bilateral it is immediate coming to our own uh, publication in ijo where we did immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery this is one of the largest series 2470 eyes a five year retrospective study and uh, we looked at the uh, results and uh, complications if you look at the results you can see that post op spherical equivalent 92 more than 92% has less than 0.5% and 99% had less than one diopter of spherical equivalent so biometry is not an issue uh, nowadays and uh, this is the same thing you can see 92% uh, uh, had a spherical equivalent of uh, less than 0.5% and complications only 0.44% pcr times of 0.16 uh, vitreous loss 0.08 cme prolonged direct is 1.3 so the complication rates were quite low and uh, arshinov also noted that um, rates of unilateral endophthalmitis after uh, simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery were compared to or lower than for unilateral cataract surgery this is published in current uh, opinions in ophthalmology so this is all scientific research and also compared to uh, bilateral uh, sequential uh, uh, delayed sequential cataract surgery there's no evidence that immediate uh, surgery was associated with worse post operative uh, vision or uh, refractive error or an increased risk of complications this is scientific data of out of 13711 eyes comparative study so there are a few keys to success competent surgeon with confidence with a complication rate of less than uh, 0.5% uh, selection of cases also are important best sterility equipment you can't do it uh, for everybody so when procedures like lasik multifocal iols icls can be done bilaterally while not bilateral cataract surgery amount of patient inconvenience and discomfort is greatly re uh, reduced and effect of second eye syndrome is abolished especially in today's times dear friends we have to think about bilateral 
uh, immediate uh, cataract surgery. And to do bilateral surgery is basically a mental block rather than any other barrier. And I challenge my opponent to prove scientifically with scientific data that delayed surgery is better than immediate bilateral sequential su surgery in selected cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Ramurthy, you have to give your best hit. Sri Ganesh has really reeled out a lot of statistics. Sri Ganesh, at least stop sharing your screen. Allow me in. There you go. All yours, Ram. <laughs> Great talk, Sri, as usual. Chitra told me to prepare for it. Oh, uh, yeah. The same thing she told me to. Uh, well, I mean, thanks, AOS ARC, for uh, uh, allowing me in. And I'm definitely for uh, bilateral sequential bilateral cataract surgery, but I'd like to have a delayed sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Let me offer a scientific explanation for doing this. What are my concerns with ISBCS? It's bilateral endophthalmitis, bilateral TAS, bilateral cystoid macular edema, in case we have missed out on the macular evaluation or something which can even occur postoperatively, they know. And we are unable to get the refractive insight from the first eye and decreased reimbursement for physician in certain healthcare systems. These are a collection of uh, reports, scientific reports, papers, which have been published of bilateral endophthalmitis, which have occurred after ISBCS. Obviously, the numbers are small, and almost all these reports were secondary caregivers where the endophthalmitis has occurred somewhere else. The patient has gone elsewhere for the treatment. So obviously, just because the numbers reported are less, that does not mean there is no occurrence because many of them might be going under the radar. Getting bilateral endophthalmitis after bilateral cataract surgery is nothing to be proud of and nobody is going to be talking much about it. So obviously, this does occur. And these are some of the uh, <clears throat> pictures that I've taken out of the papers that were published. Leave alone statistics, leave alone numbers. I do not want to face this kind of a situation even once in my professional lifetime, especially nowadays, now that we are doing talking about prelex, talking about patients with 6 6 vision. Obviously, uh, even if one patient in your entire professional lifetime ends up with a situation like this, that's totally unacceptable. Let us look at a scenario a reported case 80 year old Parkinsonism patient with dementia and cataract. Preoperative visual equity of 2050, 2060. He underwent, he was from Northern California, but for reasons went over to Mexico, where an uncomplicated in the back single piece intraocular lens surgery was done. And night after the surgery, the patient was found in the restroom, confused and covered in his own stool. Maybe it was a matter of convenience for him to go over, save cost cutting, and then a demented patient for him to travel, etc. is a, a difficulty. And that's why perhaps the bilateral cataract surgery was done. But imagine his plight. It, it was initially diagnosed as TAS, subsequently underwent vitrectomy on the first post-operative date, diagnosed as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and uh, was shifted to Northern California for a repeat vitrectomy, ended up with bilateral thysis without pain. Obviously, as somebody who started out with 2050, 2060, and a de Parkinsonism dementia is a terrible state to be in. You might say it's anecdotal, but we do not want to face this kind of a situation ever again. Obviously, we are a population of 1.3 billion, and we cannot escape from the fact that community ophthalmology would continue to deliver cataract uh, eye surgery. And obviously, these patients are not too well educated. Hygiene is not so good. And on and off, we hear about cluster endophthalmitis. Imagine a cluster endophthalmitis occurring in a scenario where bilateral cataract surgery has been occurring. Leave alone the harm that will cause to that particular practice. I believe the whole world of ophthalmology will be in turmoil. The other factor I will be concerned about is bilateral tasks that can set in. Obviously, less devastating than bilateral endophthalmitis, but equally of concern. And sometimes it could lead on to significant visual morbidity bilaterally. And in, at the other end of the spectrum, in case you are dealing with bio, uh, premium intraocular lenses, then refractive insight from the first time for optimizing refractive outcomes after bilateral surgery is almost always lost. It's every patient of mine, whether it's monofocal or multifocal, I always counsel for second eye surgery. I tell them that it is second eye surgery which is going to give you best possible vision. Look at a scenario like this. These are all screenshots of my actual patients. Underwent LRCS with Symphony multifocal and excellent vision for distance and intermediate but required a plus one doctor for the near vision. Obviously, unhappy. 
So we went ahead and implanted a Technis Plus 4D in the other eye. Wilson match. Look at this scenario where you find that what was required was a plus 0.5 diopters. So in this situation, we just did a mini monovision, titrated the uh, power of the eye in the second eye so that bilaterally implanted, they did well. Another case you see uh, EDOF toric multifocal that has been implanted, but again, there is a somewhat inadequate near vision in the unhappy patient because plus one diopter. So the second eye goes ahead and receives a toric trifocal lens, which obviously optimizes the kind of outcome that this patient has. And coming to the reimbursement as such, 100% for the first time, 50% the second eye is what is there in the US. In Japan and Israel, no reimbursement of the second eye. In most countries, when bilateral surgery is done, reimbursement of the second eye is somewhat less. Maybe it's not so in India because it's not widely practiced. But once it becomes a norm, obviously insurance companies are going to look into the reimbursement. And what's our last of my slide? What is our protocol when we do delayed sequential bilateral cataract surgery? Patient walks in for a complete evaluation. Discharged soon after the first eye surgery, reviewed a week later, and evaluated uh, or at the same time the second eye is operated. And any only if there is a doubt about the outcome in the first eye, any tests are done. And the patient goes back and comes back only for a glass prescription bilaterally a week or six weeks later, if at all is needed. We have cataract cowboys, I think, with the only need for bilateral surgery is for the economics of the doctor. So you can ensure an excellent surgeon. Patients are always going to come back to you for the second eye surgery. Don't worry about it. Keep the patient's concern as your primary uh, concern. Thank you so much. Dr. C. Ganesh, I think. Yeah. Ram, I think, I think uh, it's finally about the money because you are worried about the reimbursements primarily and you make more money than me doing delayed cataract surgery. So let me give my points. The first he showed a patient, 80-year-old patient with dementia who was covered in his own stools. Of course, if you go into your own stool or, uh, and put your head into your own stools or if you go into the swivage plant, then the risk of endophthalmitis is more. So the case selection is very important. I am a member of the International Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgeons. There is a society like that and the society has protocols. I couldn't talk about it, but it's in our paper, which we published in the IGO. So you will have to... Uh, case selection is very important. This patient was not an appropriate patient for bilateral cataract surgery. He didn't have caregivers. He was alone. He was not taken care of. And if you have infective material in both your eyes immediately after cataract surgery, what else can you expect? So that was a one-off case which you cannot project. The second is you are talking about refractive errors. Now, in our case, 92% had spherical equivalent of within 0.5 and nearly 99% within one diopter. So the accuracy, the refractive accuracy is very good with today's biometry equipment formulae. So that's not a concern at all. And thirdly, you said you do surgery after one week. So can't you get an endophthalmitis after one week? Delayed endophthalmitis, fungal endophthalmitis, sequestrated endophthalmitis, all of them occur after three weeks. So what is the justification in doing the second eye after one week? That means you have to wait for at least three months if you want to delay your second surgery. That means your protocol is not okay. You're just doing it after one week so that you get better reimbursements. That's the whole reason. And I rest my case. Thank you. I think you have to have take your chance to save yourself. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, as far as most of the elderly patients are, are always at risk of things going wrong, this was not just a one-off case. I presented a whole series of cases which have been reported in the literature of bilateral endophthalmitis. Obviously, the incidence of what has been reported is quite small. And obviously, in expert hands like yours, in excellent premium setups like yours, it might work well. In a larger scale, in larger practice, I am also aware of the uh, um, what has been put forth by the uh, Association of Bilateral Surgeons. But it's such a large paper, and I'm sure that many of the surgeons who are doing this have not even gone through it and not adapting to it completely. And as far as refractive inaccuracy is concerned, I am not none of these patients which I alluded to, the three samples that I showed, had anything uh, bad refractive outcome. It was not bad biometry. Basically, what I want to drive home is we don't aim at emetropia in both eyes. Depending upon the refractive outcome in the first eye, 
I titrate the power, whether I need a minus 0.5 or I change the type of intraocular lens that I'm going to put in, because it's the convenience, the comfort level of the patient is what matters to me. I want a happy patient at the end of the surgery. I might leave the first eye with 6, 6, and 8, and other eye with 6, 6, 6, 9, and 6. And I think the second eye surgery obviously offers me an excellent opportunity to titrate the kind of power, the type of lens that I'm putting in. And yes, you can't diverse the commerce of ophthalmology from the science of ophthalmology. And you are in you are in that game. I am in that game. And uh, if uh, tomorrow the reimbursements drop because you are doing the second eye surgery at the same time, I am sure you are also going to go ahead and do a second eye surgery a week apart. And most of the complications, whether it's endophthalmitis, stars, etc., present within a week's time. And obviously, you can't wait endlessly for these things to present. And I believe one week is most often a reasonable time period. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Ramoti for certain things like case selection is important in the surgeon also. Even a second it chance? depends upon the surgeon. So you your complication rate has to be less than 0.5%. Your rate of endophthalmitis has to be less than 1 in 15,000 if you want to do bilateral. And it has to be in a premium setting. You cannot do it in a camp setting. We also do camps. We do almost about 10,000 surgeries every year in our camp settings, but we never do bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery in a camp setting because you do not have the facility for that. So that is very important. What the take home message is, if you want to do bilateral cataract surgery, your case selection has to be good. As a surgeon, you have to be very competent. Your OT sterilization techniques have to be absolutely on and your biometry. So these are the things. Thank you very much. I think both of us are debating because not because the sake of debate, but because we passionately believe in what we are saying. And I think that applies to Sri Ganesh as well as to me. I do, I believe that I have a premium setup, but still I don't do that because I believe that when I titrate the uh, kind of surgery, the type of lens that I implant at the second eye, I end up getting much better results. Dr. Gaurav, both of them would go on and on if left to them. Uh, I need your conclusive thoughts on that. Okay. Dr. Gaurav? Uh, Dr. Chitra, Gaurav you put me in a... Can you hear me? Is, yes, Gaurav sir. is confused. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please yeah? go ahead. Okay. Go. So, Dr. Chitra has put me in a very difficult situation, you know. She's, uh, I'm caught between the devil and the deep sea, close friend, Sri Ganesh, close friend, Dr. Ramamurthy and Dr. Chitra has invited me. If I, you know, if I make a mess of this, I'm not going to come into any of the ARC debates in future as a panelist. So anyway, let me try to do my best. Remember, I'm uh, the cowboy with I the think, gun. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think uh, both of you have done an amazing wow. job and Sri Ganesh has wow. made a very strong point for... Um, you just need to tell who sizzled more. <laughs> so <laughs> both sizzled so well. But um, uh, Sri Ganesh made an excellent point with all the things that he said, uh, and they all make a lot of sense, and they are beginning to make more and more sense as times are, you know, evolving, and we are moving into a newer era, especially with COVID, and th uh, the situation is changing where more of insurance, and the, like the US now, they have more and more simultaneous bilateral because the caregivers are also the insurers, and they prefer to cut costs and you know do perform simultaneous surgery, less visits to the hospital, all that stuff holds true. Something which uh, I did, and as well, you know, because you have, uh, you know, in, in your controlled environment, as you said, and in fact, the last part that you said made all the sense that, you know, in your controlled environment where quality is and everything is excellently controlled, you are able to offer this, but not in your charity setups where, you know, there is that risk where, uh, you know, uh, there can be small compromises. So you have to have the best of everything and only very few setups would qualify or very few surgeons would qualify where with proper case selection, they may be able to do this. And yes, it is definitely to be looked into as one of the options. I've done it for a few cases myself where there was a mentally retarded patient who could not be brought in for surgery a second time. So under very controlled things. One place where Shri Ganesh, where I felt that, you know, PPE kit, we cannot save on. If we are doing simultaneous bilateral, I would definitely change the whole thing. The sets, the PP kit, everything should be probably changed. You could even do it like one case in the morning and the other one after two hours, you know, with a totally new kind of, uh, you know, uh, on the same day, but in different sittings, that would make sense. But uh, that said, I think uh, my personal uh, school thought, and I started thinking, have I become old school of thought when Dr. Ramamurthy was speaking that, you know, uh, I feel that uh, all the points that he raised were also very valid. And I agree with those because, um, you know, uh, second, I, I also feel that I can titrate my refractive results a little better. Biometric surprises can be managed. Multifocal patients can be managed a little better. Risks are obviously a little less. Yes, with the, you know modern technology, endoffs are seen very rarely with intracameral antibiotics and everything. Yet, even that one patient where you might get it. So I think we are moving in that direction and the future may show us more and more simultaneous, uh, immediately simultaneous bilateral in select situations, in select setups. But that should not be the take-home message for the Indian audience. 
in sitting in all the all over the country where 90 maybe if not 90 70 to 80 percent of our surgery is done in you know setups which may not qualify for a, a, a similar thing and the surgeons may not qualify and the meticulousness may be an nbhs approved setup like yours so i think i've made my point and uh, it, it, i think both ways are good but you have to be sure what you want to do yes dr gaurav you did put it across and i think people have to be very intelligent and decide what is best to them whether it was the first debate or the second the idea of the whole thing was for us to think very rationally and do what is right for individual setups on to you dr srinivas yes madam so dear friends after the super colossal debate between the two superstars dr sri ganesh and dr ramamurthy we'll move on to the next team of young two young guns attacking the issue the dr nishant madivanan the dancing hero who dared the worst challenge from chennai versus dr samaresh and another elegant and a charming person from jaipur who could find his way out out of anything so the debate here is anterior vitrectomy is intuitive for the anterior segment surgeon versus the pars plana makes the most preferred approach so over to you dr nishant you go first and we look forward to a winning debate from you thank you thank you so much sir for the wonderful introduction i'll just share my screen and uh... is it seen sir yeah yeah please go yeah so no, yeah my time starts so i don't have any financial interest but uh, definitely have the finance interest of what uh, samresh has so you have told it very perfectly what an anterior surgeon should do the anterior vitrectomy so definitely i cannot defeat samresh in two things one is his personality looks and definitely his grants and help from alcon company so we all know all these movies from the past they've always said never poke anyone from the back and if samresh is planning to do something like this definitely that's not something which i can win it's like telling a corneal segment surgeon showing him this and say see the layers even if you mark out the layers i'm definitely not going to know which layer is what so coming over to the procedure it is so simple when you do it anterior the fear of the vitreous loss for any anterior segment is there you just have to put some trialenol on make sure that you stain the vitreous properly and always you will have some in the wound there is no vitreous loss without it being in the wound so always start from the section so you can always do this vitrectomy only if you do the limbal approach and then when you start going in either with the 23 gauge or 20 gauge do it near the iris and then for vitrectomy actually they say that you can go below there was a false misconception that the uh, vitreous comes forward but as long as you cut and aspirate which i'm sure samresh also will agree the chances of vitreous coming forward is definitely very less and you can even sweep through the main port go all see the vitreous which is attached at the section and also you can do the vitrectomy as well when you go through the anterior approach i'm definitely sure reaching the anterior segment is going to be tough in places where you have some remnant cortex or anything it is also an easy approach because it is something similar to the bimanual aspiration that we do so you can see that the remnant cortex and all which can be removed even anteriorly and you can go little to the core of the vitrectomy base you don't have to go too much back and you definitely have to see what you uh, cut so i drive this kind of a red car with this machine is what i have i'm definitely sure with samresh's machine and his car which he uses he will always get the 23 gauge vitrectomy he should know that all of us don't get the 23 gauge vitrectomy for all these machines so with the side port which we normally use a 20 gauge will snugly fit all of you must agree that you should have a snugly fit uh, side port for the vitrectomy and if at all you do a uh, side port and make it a 20 gauge you definitely have to suture the sclerotomy or put a trocar so this is also where you have a pcr you can do it at the iris plane and then you can see that the pcr does not extend which is something which they say there are chances of extending and uh, to also note that when uh, you also place the iol and then if you want to wash the visco you can actually go anteriorly behind i mean uh, through the limbus behind the iol while washing the visco you can also cut and uh, we have moved over from the micro incision cataract surgery to what samresh is going to talk about the multiple incision cataract surgery and we all know that uh, when you want to have a, after a vitreous loss the first thing this is done by a retinal surgeon you can see the hypotony this fear if you get while doing Uh, trying to put a trocar or any port is going to be definitely tough for an anterior segment surgeon let us all be sure of that we are not posterior segment surgeons 
and putting this amount after a hypotony you will definitely make sure that you damage the retina on the other side or do an optic nerve sheath fenestration by <laughs> injecting the trocar and not only one then you decide your infusion port is there and you need another so you make it multiple incisions so when we don't have proper literature finally it comes down to the crowd's choice i was the best because the crowd loved me the crowd So there was a poll, audience poll, which was done in ASCRS, uh, where they showed that seventy percentage of them performed bimanual anterior vitrectomy. Samaresh can actually have that six percentage of the people who actually performed bimanual past planar vitrectomy. Seconds. And coming over to the complications, yes, this is the most important. Uh, when you go anteriorly, wow, iris tissue injury. I think there is nothing more to add to it. and when you go past planar that you go the retinal tear the detachment the hypotony the effusion the hemorrhage uh, uh, for the an end of the mitis i'm sure that all these complications are possible even in anterior vitrectomy but when you have to choose for the patient's benefit the risk of anterior vitrectomy through past planar when it is increasing why do you as a surgeon want to give an increased risk of uh, problem to the patient and somebody else say always fight me anteriorly never go behind my back because if i have to teach you a lesson i will go and what never means to teach you a lesson in the proper way so thank you dr chitra madam thank you aios for giving me this opportunity that was wonderful nishan very yeah. good wonderful so over back to dr samaresh so we all know dr samaresh is from jaipur dr samaresh we want you to pilot this debate and we all know what a pilot can do to any stable government right so just go ahead uh, samaresh we would like to look forward to your punch line so first of all at the outset i'd like to thank uh, dr shrinivas uh, for a beautiful introduction dr chitra for inviting me for this debate and i'd like to acknowledge the presence of one of the teachers who shaped my career dr meenakshi who's also presenting today uh, it's it's been an honor i and nishant i i love the fact that you rehearsed the talk so well you know it's uh, i mean you had to work hard for it while i just made my slides listening to you so it's very important to understand i'm just going to discuss simple science for you know if you had just attended anatomy lectures you would know first of all in techniques you never do anything through the main port so forget about pars planar when you talk about limbal don't touch the main port and you were vitrectomizing on the main port which is something you don't want to do because it's like a lip it will open and it will prolapse more vitreous separate the irrigation from the aspiration that's the first thing so that i think you didn't cover so i thought i'll bring it up for the crowd but we are not crowd and we are here to teach because we are a little class apart so the question right now i understand is whether we should approach the uh, the vitrectomy uh, the pcr to a limbal or a pars planar route now why a limbal route we all know limbal is familiar territory that's what our teachers taught us uh, in our uh, time you know they said no no don't go limbal way don't go the pars planar way people will get confused and since then it's been the norm and so everybody has been continuing the problem is as a cataract surgeon our goal if at all is to fix the iol inside the capsular bag in which if we can because that is what we have committed to the patient when we started the cataract surgery typically a posterior capsule tear would enlarge so nishan brought about in sometimes the tear doesn't enlarge and that's because the tear is so big already that there's no way no more place to enlarge it at all so you have to look at the size of the tear and keep it small and sometimes when you enlarge the tear you cannot fix the lens where it's supposed to be inside the capsular bag pars planar what's the good part i'm discussing pars planar with trick me from a cataract perspective so most often you can avoid enlargement of a posterior capsular tear from where it started and i'll show you how you can do a thorough vitrectomy and the consequences are minimal because right now as i said the damage is already done with the posterior capsule rupture you have to save grace right now put the lens in a committed place and sensibly refer the patient to a retinal surgeon for the further evaluation the problem is we are scared because it's unfamiliar territory we are intimidated because it's all past planar and it needs an elaborate setup but that's what nishan said but i completely disagree with what he said to understand when you do a limbal vitrectomy you're putting an upward drag on the vitreous body so small pcr that started causes more and more vitreous to prolapse finally enlarging the pcr into a ragged log big one which you are unable to salvage and then you'll have no choice but to put the place uh, put the lens in the sulcus compare it to a pars planar where the irrigation is limbal but you approach the vitreous from behind the posterior capsule you drag that small vitreous back into the posterior compartment trying to keep the edges of the pcr nice and controlled and the pcr would typically not enlarge and then you can later tackle this pcr by one of many ways like a posterior capsular excess so the slow motion looking at looking at it scientifically 
If you look at this, we are doing a very slow motion video photography using uh, 300 frames per second. Notice that when you do a limbal vitrectomy, notice that upward drag, the whole vitreous body tends to jump up anteriorly, something that's not visible with the naked eye on a routine microscopic or a surgery. But if you slow it down, you realize how much it's moving. And a small PCR that you saw is now has a sharp edge. It's expanding like a zipper. Compare it to a pars plana, in which the irrigation is through the limbal root, through a side port, and the vitrector is in the pars plana, and notice that there is no movement of the uh, PCR margins, and it's so simply controlled that you can clean up vitreous completely. Not only in the AC area of PCR, so again, this is a uh, this is a Miyake apple view, where we are recording, we are operating from the top, but recording the eye from the bottom. Notice that if you do a limbal vitrectomy, you have a very, very small area to play around, simply because you're limited by the anatomy that you're approaching. You can only clear your vitreous in the area of the PCR. Compare it to a pars plana, you can move all around. You can not only move in the area of PCR, but go beyond that to clear up the entire area of the vitreous base, a little bit of the anterior vitreous face, so that the IOL has a symmetrical scaffold. Now, what would you want to do? You want to do a small little seconds. just to save grace, or you want to clear up the bed completely and have a stable center fixated IOL. I'm just going to run you through a case because that's, that is, you know, that is the final litmus test. So this is a patient, second eye, undergoing a restore, uh, multifocal surgery, everything goes as per plan. Uh, the IOL goes into the capsular bag, tend to place the IOL right in its place. It's a well-centered IOL. And then I'll go ahead and this is, this is the end of the surgery if you look at it. And you know, everybody is done and dusted. Finally, go ahead and do a bimanual irrigation aspiration. It's very important to keep the aspiration out of the uh, posterior capsule open area. And that's exactly what I'm doing. But for some reason, the posterior capsule was weak. And there happens a big PCR over there. The IOL is in the bag. And what would one do? I understand there is a PCR you're committed to looking for vitreous. A good way to look for vitreous, like Nishan brought about, is to use preservative-free triamcinolone acetate after securing the incisions and making sure there's no prolapse happening. I'm trying to reposition the lens, hoping that there is no vitreous, but nothing happens, so I stay in the vitreous. And like Nishan said, there is vitreous right at the incision, because that is normally where it would prolapse. Now, the big question that arises is, how do you approach this? I approach it the past plan away. So, I'm making a trocar entry, but if you don't have a trocar, don't get scared, use an MVR knife and just make an entry and suture it later. There's nothing great in suturing. But notice that with the limbal irrigation and the vitrector posteriorly, this entire vitreous body that had come anteriorly drains back right through the PCR into the posterior compartment. And it is so visually appealing to see this, the whole thing going back to where it belonged and you clearing it up right then and there. And you started a limbal route, this would keep on draining and then you would have to go through one side port and another side port and it would go on and on and the PCR would enlarge and you'll have to explant the lens more often than not. Once you've severed the connection between the vitreous that is prolapsed anteriorly and the vitreous that is drained back into the vitreous, Whatever little is left behind in the anterior compartment can then be tackled limbally because there's nothing wrong with doing the limbal vitrectomy for taking off that guillotine little bit vitreous that is left behind. And then you finally, again, going beyond the areas of the PCR and going across, in like I showed in a Miyake apple view, you can clear up far more than you aim for uh, with the limbal vitrectomy. But what's the final result? Finally, you are able to center the lens. The PCR, which happened here, got limited to its presence over there and did not enlarge, extend at all. This is the patient at three months follow-up with the multifocal lens in the eye, second eye which you committed, well-centered, stable eye, well, 360 degrees capsular excess cover. Good side is the PCL patient might not develop a PCO in half the lens anyways. So the choice is ours at the end of the day to see a well-fixated lens that we have managed to go through just because we chose to go through a pass plan route and what, that one incision that we are scared of can always be tackled with one suture. Needless to say, the patient needs to be referred to a retinal surgeon, but the choice at the end of the day left to the audience would you want a lens like this in the sulcus just because you were scared of doing a pass when I would me? Or would you rather go ahead and spend that extra half an hour with whatever machine you have, with whatever cut rate you have? And if you don't have an MVR setup, you just a trocar, make a, just an MVR, make an entry, do a pass when I would me, have a well centered stable iron. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Nishant. Your chance. Yes. Uh, oh. Yeah, I just have one small. I can't hear you. Just, uh, hello? hello? Am yes. I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just have one small, just uh, second, sir, for retaliation. Yeah. So as he said, I wanted his financial interest of high speed cutter and the Miyake machine, which shows in a place when you place the lens. And then I agree with Samresh that that is the best way. But when you come into the PCR, first is irrigation aspiration, then is FACO and last is coming IOL placement. I just have one person 
who will definitely agree with me who will fight for me i just want all of you to see the video which was presented in iirsi one of the leading international conference just please all of you listen to why dears that one person who will support me the videos uh, it's a good idea to stay in with trans and alone my choice of uh, vitrectomy is general limbal vitrectomy here because in certain situations with the limbal vitrectomy and uh, bevel turned upside oh, down you can get enough curing in that area <laughs> yeah, I think Nishant, you caught me there because sometimes you got to defend the other thing as well. I think uh, uh, Nishant is a very dangerous man. He's like a tahel ka thay. He's going there. Yes. Uh, what is uh, Dr. Nishant? Dr. Amrish, you would like to counter telling it as a forfeiting or a, uh, the capped video or something like that, or would like to counter your point? No, I think I think that I was trying to make a point over there. That if you're scared of pars plena, you can still do limbal. Uh, in a small PCR which has rounded edge, but he didn't show that part. Fantastic, <laughs> great. So because he comes from the land of pilot, so he knows how to handle <laughs> situations very well. Yeah. Thank you, Suresh. Thank, Suresh. You. Thank, Thank you, Nishan. That was a wonderful debate. Thank you, sir. So being a vitreoidal surgeon, I'm always biased because of the past planar route. So let's hear from a more neutral man today. Uh, we have a senior most uh, respected, Dr. Dibashish, sir. Your thoughts on these, please. Yeah, uh, I think both of them uh, made. Uh, Wonderful points. Uh, obviously, uh, Nishant's uh, presentation was fantastic. Uh, never hit from the back. And Samresh, as usual, uh, coming from the school of teachers, tried to you know put the perspective uh, right. Uh, I think you know anterior vitrectomy is something which we have grown up with, but it's time that we really consider the past plane of vitrectomy. Because of so many advantages, which Samresh men mentioned, and uh, you know, he just mentioned uh, that uh, the obviously the vitreous won't come up and uh, the uh, rent won't enlarge. But think of other situations where you have the two halves of the nucleus still there in the eye, and then there is a, a vitreous. You have a lot of cortex behind, and still you have to, you know, uh, you have a PCR at that point. So I mean, in those situations. We need to, uh, I mean, uh, Nishant uh, showed the American Academy poll, but then, you know, there was that 20% and this is the beginning. I think we have to mature and uh, this part, I think we need to learn. So uh, I think I'll pick Samresh as my teacher. Thank you, sir. But Nishant, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, request Dr. Chitra, madam. Over to you, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, and the youngsters have really did well. So we shall now go on to a very another vibrant issue for debate. Okay. With so many proficient cataract surgeons, don't you wonder why you need to get an eczema? So we have with us a young, dynamic Dr. Gitansha, who is going to tell us exactly with every literature backup as to why she thinks what she does. Fake mm -hmm. IOLs for all refractive errors against fake IOLs for extremes of refractive error. But then we also need to know that we have Dr. Krishna Prasad, the unbeatable, the unchallenged hero from Hubli, who's going to be a deadly opponent, who is going to have his own sound reasons for his cause. So let's hear from you, Gitansha. Your lead first. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all of you. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to describe as to why fake intraocular lenses are my solution for all refractive errors. I have no financial disclosure. Now, there are a couple of characteristics of the fake intraocular lens which make it my procedure of choice. The lens is biologically inert. It has a better optical quality, a larger optic zone, and higher efficacy and stability as compared to the keratorefractive procedures. Now, what makes this lens inert? We all know that the colamer has a high affinity for the fibronectin in the aqueous, which forms a layer on the lens and subsequently protects it from the inflammatory mediators in the aqueous. You can see that an acrylic lens, which is routinely used in cataract surgery, has a dense protein deposition within a minute of exposure, as against the near absence of proteins on the surface of the colamma. Now, one of the disadvantages of placing an implant in the eye might be that the internal reflectance would result in secondary images and result in photoic phenomena such as glare and halos. However, the internal reflectance of the colamma is the same as the testaline lens 
and it does not result in excessive amount of glare and halos post operatively which is not the case in ablations following keratorefractive procedures the quality of vision as against the mtf the stirls ratio and the osi have shown that the quality of eyes undergoing this phakic iol implant is the same as that of a normal eye the higher order aberrations again are significantly lower as compared to other implants including silicon aclisoft and the sensar lenses now one of the most important advantages would be an enlargement of the optic zone on the cornea the effective optic zone is 1.25 times the optic zone of the lens which means that while we're treating powers of up to 13.5 we can give the patient an optic zone of 7 mm or greater which is not at all possible with any corneal based procedure now my opponent may uh, uh, say that the complications including cataract are one of the potential drawbacks however with the advent of the central hole models the 360 degree micron hole allows a good movement of the aqueous and the rates of complications such as cataract have drastically reduced they also allow a lower vault and studies have successfully shown the implantation of fake iols in ac depths as low as 2.4 mm over a four year follow up Now Cochrane reviews have also shown that the fake IOL vis-a-vis the excimer laser has a greater efficacy, a better safety and a better contrast for both moderate as well as high myopia. Again, a number of studies have shown that even in low myopia the performance is equivalent to the high myopia and the higher order aberration profile is definitely significantly better than laser vision correction. Now one can argue that these lenses are uh more costly to the patient however the indian varieties cost the same as the femtosecond laser as well as the smile procedures additionally there is nil initial investment for the surgeon wherein one does not need to spend money on the femtosecond or the excimer platform and no additional surgical training is required and any surgeon who is comfortable with cataract and the anterior segment can do this procedure with great ease special situations like corneal ectasias both idiopathic and iatrogenic patients who have undergone an intracorneal ring segment implantation or patients with a lamellar keratoplasty can also undergo these phakic implants to correct their refractive errors while this obviously is a contraindication for keratorefractive procedures Thanks. again one of the important things that uh, we can uh, one of the other important things is that once the patient develops a cataract The IOL power calculation is essential. No special formula is needed with the fake implants. Thus, one can get more accurate results post-operatively. So, I just like to conclude that there are obviously a large amount of advantages of the fake IOL over the laser vision correction, which makes it my procedure of choice for even the low refractive errors. Thank you. Very good talk, Dr. Gitansha, Dr. Krishna Prasad. she has raised yeah. many valid issues we really need to fight for your cause thank you very much uh, arcoas and dr chitra and the team uh, so fake iol should be reserved only for extreme refractive error i think uh, the, the other one thing i mean the opposite of this has been told by my opponent i think uh, to speak I mean, opposite to this particular topic of mine, it requires a great deal of brave heart and you know good measure of you know clinical ineptitude. I mean, let me probably introduce uh, Dr. Geeta Anshar for you. Uh, Dr. Geeta Anshar, you no know, young people are basically very impulsive, like Dr. Geeta Anshar, a lot of cortisol and a lot of adrenaline because they're very impressionable. They believe the company narratives very easily and uh, they are vulnerable to market pressures and whatever the people say, you know, they are not very resilient. They quickly change. and also they lack the wisdom teeth so corneal procedures for low to moderate myopia refractive errors and fake iols for high myopia this has been a common understanding and a common sense okay i think what is the beast uh, the beauty and the beast the beauty here is the lasik and the smell which we have been doing for a long time and the beast is the fake iol which uh, you know has its own share of problems See, the lasik and smile has been the best thing that has happened in the century. 
the newer technologies that have come in and the new very skillful surgeons bringing a lot of innovative techniques okay have you know we have the better understanding of corneal biomechanics and the pathophysiology of uh, ectasia has been very well understood and it has been time tested and you know it's also economical because ICLs are very costly for the patient, especially the toric people are coming in the fatic eyeballs, much easier with you no know, trans-PRK and surface ablations. So this is a very important question that I want to answer. Why anybody wants to perform a fatic uh, eyeball for low to moderate myopia? I know when Dr. Chitra asked me to take up this topic, I said, Dr. Chitra, there is no debate here. My opponent will be in great trouble that person will be defenseless. You know, please do not give this. So this will be very difficult for my opponent. But she said that is exactly the point because I'm giving to Dr. Geetansha, who is my daughter-in-law. Okay, so the borderline corneal thickness. She said for borderline corneal thickness, probably there is a case for ICL. But we know that with the present techniques, the kind of new innovation that have happened in the corneal refractive surgery, we are able to take care of this. She said this potopsia. I think if you have a hole right in the center, you may create... You know, solve many problems, but that itself can cause this photopsia. Reduce contrast, and they say there is a lot of uh, aberration that are induced. Okay, the fear of ectasia, the problems with you know eye oil power calculation. See, you have cataracts with ICLs and fake eye oil, so there the problem of eye oil power estimation comes. For refractive surgery, if you are doing to low to moderate myopia, you don't have to worry about cataract and even the eye oil power calculation. So let me tell you this. Fake eyeball is a demon if untamed. There's an intraocular procedure. In an young patient, you are trying to put something into the eye. There's a possibility of endophthalmitis. Inflammation, you are trying to put a foreign body between a clear, well-functioning crystalline lens and an iris, which is extremely sensitive. So you're going to create a low-grade inflammation in that patient forever. And I'm a glaucoma surgeon myself. I've seen so many problems where the angle has been compromised by a wrong sizing and intractable glaucoma leading to, I mean, removal of uh, ICLs. But obviously, cataract formation tops the list because over a period of time, the vaulting changes and invariably it leads to lens touch and cataract formation. There are a lot of unresolved problems. Sizing has always been an issue. Whatever is the technique, whatever is the I mean, place, everybody has a problem with white to white, sulcus to sulcus. It can never be, it has not been resolved so far. And also we know that there's a gradual reduction in the vault, almost, you know, every 15 microns per year at least. It finally seconds. ends up with reducing the vault to almost dangerous. Toric phagic eye walls rotate post-operative. It's not like a capsule sticking to a toric eye wall. But the toric phagic eye walls do rotate post-operatively. So there are three, if you, whatever villains you have, you want uh, Mogambo, you want Joker, you want, you know, whoever. Cataract formation, endothelial cells. In an young patient, you are putting it in the foreign body there, and there is 0.6% is a gradual loss every year, but we have something up to 7% endothelial cell loss per year. It can be really scary. And once you do an intraocular procedure, you're going to change the vitreous dynamics. There's an increased risk of body in these patients. See, low to moderate myopia. Don't worry, Gitansha. We have femtolasic where we can do thin flaps. We have smile extra. And residual stromal thickness, it need not be a bugbear. We have a lot of, you know, we do understand ectasia is caused by so many other factors. And it is still a treatable cause. So please save our patients from a myopic, the wrong, I'm getting the wrong photograph, this is the photograph, from myopic surgeons. No, we do have Hands to up. have. See, very literature savvy. She pulled out so many literature telling the, extolling the virtues of, you know, ICL or uh, in low to moderate myopias. But eminence-based medicine says that Whatever has been time tested, well proved, that we need to. So we need to exercise caution in our judgment. We have to stay extraocular. We know cornea well by now. So let us do a corneal procedure. Let us not create a traffic jam between the anterior segment leading to glaucoma and inflammation and unwarranted post or posterior segment problems. And let us perform an advanced corneal laser procedure, which are available so that we can have a well established and very rewarding results. And very importantly, let the good sense prevail. So this is something I would like to say. Let us not create new problems just because that we know. ICL for extreme myopia, I do agree. But for low to moderate myopias, we have well-established procedure of laser vision correction. Let us stick to the rule book and let us have happy patients. Thank you very much. Good, Dr. Krishnan Prasad. Gitansha, you have a minute to rebut me. Don't spare him. 
So thank you, sir. I just retort uh, to your points one by one. The first thing you said was that the procedure is uh, not as economical, but like I've already pointed out, that the Indian varieties uh, cost the same as the procedures such as femtolasic and smile. Again, you said that there is an increase in the, uh, now we know much more about the corneal biomechanics because of which we can carry on laser vision correction safely. But we also know that patients who have early FFKC or any form of ectasia cannot undergo these procedures and we have to resort to phakic IOLs. Again, yes, being an intraocular procedure, there might be a slight risk of inflammation, but like I've already shown, collagen is exceedingly inert and the risk of inflammation is negligible. Yes, there could be a risk of infection, but even LASIK comes with its own set of unique complications. Sizing and rotation is not an issue as long as proper preoperative measurements are taken. You also pointed out that there is an increased risk of retinal detachment but that is more in patients in which in the PVD has not used or they have a high myopia. But in cases of low myopia, the risk of retinal detachment is exceedingly low. And I just like to end by saying as regards wisdom teeth, I have all four of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, quickly, I'll probably say she was very literature savvy. I do, I do appreciate that the teeth are very well done. ICL is really good. I do understand that. You have all the literatures to say that ICL is extremely good. But why do it in low to moderate myopia? When we have well, very good results with our smiles, our PRKs, patients are very happy, we're staying extraocular. Why go inside the eye and create a new problem for an young patient? Cornea is a much more well-known territory and a, basically a myo, even a low or moderate myo, when you go inside, I want to change the dynamics to an extent. We have seen patients with, you know, ICLs coming with great problems. So let us not create a new problem in a patient, especially low to moderate, which can be very well corrected by so-called the present-day laser vision corrections on the cornea. That is exactly my point. Thank you very much. Uh, both spoke very eloquently and so was the rebuttal. But I now want the president of AIOS, not Gitansha's father, to believe the right take home message to all of us. So I think the take home message is that the mother and your student also, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'm your student. I'm not I'm not giving anything to you. I'm saying that the message to take home is that the mother in law throws the daughter in law to the wolves. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and but because you are my student, so therefore you did justice and sir, think I got my compliment, sir. Yeah. Good. So in any case, uh, uh, I think uh, there are uh, lots and lots of people who are going in for uh, the uh, ICL procedure uh, as regards the procedure of choice, especially those who don't want to miss out on being refractive surgeons vis-a-vis uh, -vis not being able to afford an eczema laser or a femto. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, obviously the topic that was given to Gidansha was... Uh, to a large extent against what you said was the common, uh, commonly agreed uh, principles of uh, tackling low myopia since uh, it's a time-tested gold standard kind of a situation. And I know that Gitansha also does the same. So obviously she's uh, being uh, asked to bat with both her hands tied at the back. Uh, but I think there are uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, people who are actually wanting to do this procedure as a procedure of choice. The, number of people doing the ICL and especially the Indian equivalent has increased. And there are a lot of uh, surgeons in the periphery uh, uh, who do not afford these uh, uh, laser vision correction, they are doing it. But I think as even if I have to do it for low myopia with extremely good corneals and uh, rest everything, no dry eye, etc. I don't know whether she pointed out, but I think dry eye is one of the things where you would uh, wish to prefer to not touch the cornea. So overall, uh, yes, I would uh, tend to agree with the general practice of uh, low myopias uh, being done by uh, the uh, eczema laser or the femtolasic or the smile. Uh, that's about it. Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. I want to say something for Dr. a moment. Can I say something? Kansha did a great job and very eloquently and I'm sure made us all think and rather I even I have been wondering often enough that the fake IO results are so good there could be many more cataract surgeons who don't have eczema who could go ahead and do it. Dr. Chitra, can I button for 10 seconds? Yes. Chitra, I would fully agree with you. 
and uh, uh, forgive my ignorance i think you know we doing this for the last 10 15 years a uh, fake kiols and the results have been so consistent and the more we do it i think uh, it becomes uh, the refractive procedures as such become more uh, popular and especially hyperopias and other things which don't yield and even you know correcting press biopsy and how that we have the trifocals stabilizing so all in all i think fake kiols uh, as a refractive procedure uh, uh, forgetting our eczemas and our smileys i think uh, can be a good uh, thing for dr gaurav your thought i wanted to say that dr maipal has been very unfair to gitanjali she did such a great job of you know defending her case and i fully agree that now the future is with low powered uh, icls i've been talking about it as well and she did a fantastic job of uh, you know defending this difficult topic but uh, she was up to it and better i think it was a one one sided kind of this thing and there was no debate in it but gitansha just fought back very nicely thank you thank you uh okay krishan prasad you did very well too so we go thank on you. to the next team let's see on 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 to our so after hearing from the pers- uh, perplexing debate from the two vociferous speakers so let's move on to our next strong team we have dr vaishali vasavada a very versatile surgeon and a strong speaker from jaipur is up against dr narain shetty the prince charm of narain netralaya with the great skills in the in the set of the complex surgeries so let's hear from both of us so dr vishali will be talking on how to address the lower grades of astigmatism in cataract surgery with toric in all cases and narain would be speaking that lri and the arcuates are for the lower grades so over to dr vishali please you're muted i'm so sorry thank you sir and wish you many happy returns of the day madam dr chitra many many thanks for making me part of this so interesting debate session okay. and i'll try to keep up to the spirit can you see my screen here now no no not yet no. Hey, we just sharing. Open it. Okay. Sorry for the delay. So I think, uh, as I have been very well introduced, thank you for the kind introduction. Of course, we all have a financial interest in managing astigmatism. That's why we are all here, and same with me. and uh, i'll start my debate with saying that believe what you may want to but only th- that works what you can prove and i am here to prove the science of my concept and offer proof of this concept that low astigmatism is an entity that should only be treated with toric iols and i don't think it's even a matter of debate so good luck dr narin with all due respect does it matter does low astigmatism matter would be the question many surgeons would ask well we did this study many many years back and in uh, eyes with a monofocal iol in the bag with a best corrected vision of 66 if you took eyes that had between 0.5 and 1 diopter of refractive astigmatism they still ended up with poorer contrast sensitivity and a, sm- a lower reading speed even if you gave them glasses for uh, correcting that 0.5 or 0.75 diopters of astigmatism so the fact is that anything that is beyond 0.5 that means 0.5 0.75 matters leave alone one and beyond which was traditionally talked about when this whole astigmatism management started and uh, again as has been discussed throughout all the debates literature talks about it as well and uh, a recent study shows that 65% of cataract going patients will have anywhere between 0.25 to 1.25 diopters of corneal astigmatism so why not treat it of course you need to treat it and many of us forget that you may measure only 0.25 or 0.5 or 0.75 in the cornea but you are going to add at least 0.2 or 0.3 to it with your surgery if not more and therefore at least 55 to 60% of our cataract surgery patients belong here and i really liked what dr himanshu uh, said that we are all here to give the best outcomes yes we want to make money but our primary aim is to offer them the best outcome so why a toric iol and not an incision uh, i think the 
out and out pro points for any toric lens i am not talking about this particular brand and now we have very good indian lenses which are so much more affordable they are components of routine surgery they are accurate they are predictable there is no regression they can be reversed we all know about all this and this is just from today morning i just typed toric intraocular lens on the pubmed and you have 960 articles giving testimony to the fact that it is a technology that has worked and continues to work more and more there were two great meta analyses one from the cochrane which uh, compared toric iols and lris uh, for corneal astigmatism and it does say that astigmatism correction wise toric iols do much better there is no debate another review from china so that's why i put the cochrane review first even if you don't want to believe this it also says the same thing that toric is uh, better than incisional surgeries and then there was one in 2015 way back which said that when you treat low degrees of astigmatism the toric lenses do equally well it's not like they are not effective in fact they were more effective and more predictable compared to incisional surgeries for correction of low astigmatism and i know that with the advent of femtosecond lasers because big setups have invested in them you have to get something out of it we are talking more and more about uh, ak's and but they are incisions incisions are incisions they and they have their problems this is real data from our clinic that uh, 65 to 75% of our toric iol are designed to correct up to one diopters at the corneal plane that means low astigmatism so it's good for your practice it's good for your patients and the fact that 70% patients are taking up this technology leave aside the cost alone means that it is working it's not like we are pushing it down their throats uh, and if you we, we were not talking about refractive surgery of uh, press biopsia correction what would you do if you have an even 0.5 or 0.6 diopters of astigmatism you just can't put in any of your redoffs or multifocals or whatever kind of press biopsia correcting i will so you need a toric version so i think uh, i really don't need to uh even to start talking about the problems of incisional surgery like scale and surface symptoms regression what is the effect what nomogram do you use how much do you charge for the diamond knife or your femto ak of course it's not going to be free of cost so i think uh, it's a lot about hesitation and we as doctors need to step up where cost alone should not be a deciding factor and manage our own hesitation and i would just like to end by saying good luck narin thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishali. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Narain. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shrinivas, and uh, uh, thank you, Ch Chitra Ma'am, and uh, ARC and AIOC for uh, giving this opportunity and great presentation, Dr. Vishali. Uh, so today, so today, I was uh, told to uh, talk about or defend. Uh, let me press this button okay uh, to defend lris and ak's in low low grade uh, astigmatism correction of cataract surgery or in a way i am supposed to talk against toric for all patients of low uh, low astigmatism in uh, cataract surgery as you can see there's a very significant number of uh, you know uh, low grade of uh, astigmatism in pre op uh, patients but since we are living in india majority or let's say uh, 20 20% uh, of are below poverty and 17% are below are in the lower ca uh, caste category so are we justified to push all these patients for toric iol i really don't think so is there an alternative with no extra cost this is where the lris and ak's come into picture now why is it advantages is there is absolutely no extra cost uh, for the doctor and the and the patient uh, so they don't feel the pinch the secondly once we do it we uh, get rid the, we give them much better uh, vision for distance and they don't require uh, the glasses for distance and also they can get rid of bifocal glasses uh, and in fact if you do the monovision in the other eye in fact you the patient won't even require near glasses i don't have the data for india but the spectacle a lifetime uh, expenditure in the us for an average person is 2100 uh, dollars to 3400 and in europe is about 1700 to 4600 now the next thing is 
believe me, the patient satisfaction is absolutely amazing in these patients when you do the LRIs and AKs because the expectations is low, very low and they are uh, absolutely free. They're not paid any cost. But it's not so in, in patients who choose uh, toric IOL because they are already expectations high and they feel like it's their birthright because they paid something. They feel like they should get 100% get rid of the astigmatism. So to satisfy these patients, if something goes wrong, is very, very difficult. Now, the next thing is, uh, please, uh, I want to re, uh, re, uh, re I mean, we uh, tell the point that we are doing this free of cost. So it's almost like we are doing a service to the community. And when we do this, the gratitude, the patients, these patients have for you is completely, I mean, unmeasurable than any other patients, or if you do a toric patient who can, really can afford for it. So uh, the next thing is, even if you look at middle class patients, uh, and if they do take out from their servings and go for a flax surgery, again, you know, asking them to shell out, uh, you know, uh, money for a toric IOL when they have low grade of astigmatism. Uh, I mean, I, I feel, I mean, pretty guilty for it. You can always suggest it, but you cannot force it, definitely. So now let's look at the different error points. Now, when we look at error things, means the points where things can go wrong. Now, when we look at the uh, uh, LRIs and AKs, there's always a chance of incorrect, sa in, uh, incorrect scans, calculation errors, marking errors, depth, depth of incisions, and also there's a chance of regression. But when we look at the to toric IOL, we have multi multiple factors. So we have inadequate K readings, incorrect calculations, Im 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 improper patient selection, then there's always a chance of inadequate uh, pre-surgical uh, pre marking, defective capsular excess, misalignment of uh, IOL cylinder. And also post-surgery, there's a chance of rotation because of retained viscoelastics. And the ratio between the capsular bag and IOL is not good. Then there's a chance of rotation or it can happen because of hypertonia or over inflation of the bag. So if you just look at pure factors, there is lesser factors in LA's, uh, uh, LR and AKs uh, as compared to uh, the toric uh, IOLs. But this, I want to stress the fact that this doesn't mean any of the procedure is more superior. I'm just trying to say is there are many, many factors uh, which you have to take into counter. This is one of the reasons why there is a high variability uh, in uh, toric IOL uh, surgeries. Uh, when you look at unilateral, uh, there's about 60 to 85 uh, percent, uh, which a lot of studies uh, suggest that. And also, in, when you look at bilateral, it's about it ranges from 69 to 70. I mean, 69 to 97. So I would uh, like to conclude by saying, uh, is it right to push all lower grade of mechanism cataract surgeries for toric IOL? I would really disagree. I would uh, I would believe if the patient is affordable, uh, if the astigmatism is 0 0.75 uh, or more, then you can always go for a toric IOL. But if the patient is not affordable, which will be in majority of our cases, uh, please do not push or ask them to shell out more money. Uh, always go for a, a free LRI, uh, AKs or OCCI or even CCIs. Uh, this way you're doing a free service to your community and uh, 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 and and the blessing that you will get of free service is completely unmeasurable. So at the end, I want, I want to say that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Naren. Uh, Vishali, I think now it's your time after the philosophical little bit of ideas given by Naren. <laughs> now I think it's a time for your refutation. <laughs> thank you, Naren. Thank you so much. You know, I, I have been a fan and I'm listening more and more to a certain very learned doctor whom you happen to know, Dr. Bhujang Shetty. And I listen to him. He, I think he tends to say that uh, be stress-free, you know, enjoy what you do and give your best when you're doing it. It's only one life. So I think uh, I will do my best. And uh, I also thank you for bringing out that point about the bifocal lenses. They're really so expensive, even more so progressive. So why not do a toric and give your patients only a 250 rupee uh, ready reader again? And uh, like I said, you said it's a free service good, but it's not a service every time because uh, one, most patient, people will not do it free. And when you're doing flax, I don't think if you ask five or 10,000 more for an uh, incisional surgery, it, it becomes more of a theoretical debate. But uh, I have seen almost every patient of mine who might do an incisional procedure is unhappy at least in the first three to six months and they don't they would, they would rather say that i would have maybe borrowed or asked my insurance my agent would have fought a little more with the company but maybe i wish i had gone for the toric cleanse so i rest my case uh, thank you vishali uh, naren i'm sure that you still stand strong on your ground 
So, yeah. so, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vaishali. I think uh, uh, the, the, the point is, see, uh, for doing LRIs and this, I don't think so, uh, charging extra, I mean, money for that particular incision, I mean, doesn't make sense because if you buy one of these blades, then you can keep reusing and reusing. I think it should be okay that even if you do it free of charge, especially people who can't afford and give that better vision for them and uh, the, the happiness that they give, get out of that is uh, something some simply amazing yeah great thank you thank you and uh, i think dear viewers this debate is going on and on uh, the more fe fearful fight now we have the chief justice coming in i think madam now i leave it to the fine sense of your judgment so, no, Dr. Namrath, uh, madam. yeah yeah i yeah, i understood Srinivas. Uh, uh, i think it is always all about economics and this debate has also fallen into the same trap of economics uh, one person trying to defend against the other. Uh, the whole thing, in fact, has been low economics versus high economics. And again, like I said earlier, it is also about the patient affordability, what he can afford. But having said this, the uh, the threshold for astigmatism, for implanting toric IOLs in cases of astigmatism is decreasing. Earlier, it was 1.25 diopters, then one diopters. Uh, and I think one also has to take into consideration whether it is against the rule of stigmatism or with the rule of stigmatism, because obviously if it is against the rule of stigmatism, then your thresholds become even lower and you can go as low as 0 0.75 uh, diopters. But again, having said this, uh, there is also an issue of quality of vision. With toric eyewells, the vision tends to be uh, better as compared to with uh, LRIs or OCCIs. Uh, but again, it is also about affordability of the patient. So I think it is a balance between the economics and uh, also between what the patient wants ultimately and not what the surgeon wants. So the surgeon can convince in any manner, but if the patient is not being able to afford it, you can't do a toric eyewell. And I'm sure if the patient can afford it, even Naren wouldn't want to do a OCCI in that case. True, ma'am. So uh, you would still want to do a toric. So I think uh, one has to uh, balance between, you know, what you have to counsel the patient and uh, what the patient wants uh, eventually. He may again have Googled and found that, you know, he wants the best aisle to correct his cylinder, which is uh, correctable by the lens itself. So uh, very well, both of you did a great job, but it is difficult to, you know, say who did better, but uh, very well presented, both of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Amrita for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chitra. Plus, you can go on with the next team. Yeah, go ahead, madam. So now we'll uh, move on to our next set of speakers. So we all know that the next uh, hot topic is the controversy on addressing the myopic progression in school children with atropine. And for that, we have uh, Dr. Arun Samprati, a very capable pediatric surgeon from Bangalore, who is also the chairman scientific committee of the prestigious Bangalore Ophthalmic Society, against a very dynamic uh, ARC member from North, who got uh, elected unopposed, is Dr. Rohit Saxena, uh, the professor of pediatric ophthalmology from RPC, and a member of North Zone, uh, to accept the challenge uh, raised by Dr. Arun. Over to Dr. Arun, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for the wonderful introduction. introduction. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Chitra, madam, for giving me this opportunity uh, to present this uh, atropine for myopia control. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm a, my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. You can go ahead with the slideshow. Yeah. 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 So first of all, uh, I would uh, like to tell, like whenever you do a refraction for a child, and uh, tell the mother that the power has increased. The first thing you, is that she will tell, why did the power increase? In spite of wearing glasses, the power is increasing. Is there nothing in the world to stop this one? As if you are at fault, you, have, you are the cause for this increase in the power. That is what the, uh, the attitude of the mothers would be. So all these days I had to just cut a sorry figure and say nothing, I don't have anything to offer. And uh, unfortunately now we have the Ram band, that's the atropine uh, eye drops which can control the myopia. So if you see the uh, pandemic, uh, before the corona pandemic, myopia pandemic was there for a long time. Uh, from 5% uh, incidence of myopia in the uh, world, it has almost uh, uh, gone to 22.9. And the high myopia is about 2.7% of them. 
and by 2050 it is expected to go to 49.2 percent and 9.8 percent of them will be high myopia so dr rohit will ask what is a big deal we all know that myopia is just not myopia it's associated with so many degenerative retinal diseases glaucoma cataracts besides the cost and uh, uh, this thing of the optical correction so though we cannot stop the onset of myopia itself we can definitely reduce the progression so that we pre prevent it going for the high myopia so what are the current available modalities so there are a lot of things like the progressive glasses contact lenses environmental modifications but the only thing which has been conclusively proven is the pharmacological modification so to date the atropine has been the only medicine which has been demonstrated to consistently be effective in slowing myopia initially 0.5 and 1% were used but uh, they were having a lot of uh, uh, problems with the poor near vision and they are not able to tolerate it and also there is a incidence of rebound myopia hence the recent studies have shown that 0.01% of atropine is extremely effective in retarding the progression of myopia it is associated with minimal side effects and 98% of the children they tolerate it very well except a very few uh, uh, children who may have near vision problems and also the rebound myopia is less in this uh, concentration so the atropine does not work through the accommodative system it works through the specific m1 m4 receptors in the retina and also it has a non muscarinic effect on the scleral fibroblasts is there any scientific proof for this yes there are a lot of uh, articles uh, the most uh, important is the atom study the atom one study studied 1% one, 1 atropine however this was found to be uh, problematic because it causes near vision problems and then the atom 2 study was done where they compared 0.51 and 0.01% and they found that 0.01% is extremely effective in controlling the progression of myopia so the what are the ocular side effects you may see very minimal uh, very rarely you see photophobia slight blurred vision and a local allergic response so all these effects are very minimal and most of the children tolerate it very well so in conclusion atropine is the only ray of hope in reducing the rate of progression and controlling this myopia pandemic and it has very few side effects and very well tolerated it can be coupled with environmental modifications that has increased outdoor activities and i would like to conclude by saying my uh, opponent has already conceded the defeat when he has quoted in a public paper uh, from the kerala journal of ophthalmology where in an interview he has stated that uh, i have been using atropine eye drops for control of myopia thank you uh, thank you arun sir for your intellectual thoughts over to dr rohit yeah you are muted sir yeah uh, is my screen visible yes okay thank you uh, thank you um, arun for quoting me but you have not quoted many other things which i will be quoting which i have been talking about <laughs> sorry i'll just full screen it so my question my worry is not about pharmacological projection but the aggressive pharmacological projection that is going on to prevent myopic progression in children and i don't have any financial interests and unfortunately there is a lot of financial interest in this massive projection of atropine and i'll discuss what do we know about this and as uh, arun brought out that it's like the corona pandemic childhood myopia is like the corona pandemic we do not know much about the disease there is huge fear mongering we are clutching at straws for treatment and we do not know how this treatment we are touting actually works we'll take each point separately while parental worry for myopia is there for more than 100 years increasing near work has been blamed our mechanism or our understanding why it's happening is unclear we've talked about lack of play academic high achievers have it tabs phones computers are at fault although they are a very recent addition to our uh, children television vitamin d deficiency nowhere no one has ever shown atropine deficiency as a cause huge fear mongering this this article is oft quoted just quoted by dr arun the big thing although i respect this article and it's a wonderful one projecting 50% myopia by 2050 this report actually missed one sixth of the world's population that is india our prevalence at the moment is around 10% three of our papers have actually shown this it's important need to worry but not crippling not that fear mongering we are talking that make us ignore facts about the treatment we are talking about 
we are clutching at straws this is not a revolutionary or a miracle discovery done for treatment of myopia atropine for myopia dates back to the 1960 doses have been tested from 1% to 0.01% despite having more than 20 years of experience in low dose atropine it's still not fda approved believe it or not it's not marketed anywhere in the world including east asia where 70 to 80% children have myopia it's not even licensed for sale in singapore where these atom studies were done it's only for snec enrolled patients except in india of course it's an over the counter drug you can take bath in it and of course probably we'll soon have atropine eyeliners and mascaras as a treatment option talked about atom 1 dr arun did 1% versus placebo showed that there are it's effective but too many side effects it acts probably by accommodation or rest atom 2 tried to reduce that by 0.5 and 0.1 and you know 0.01 was the placebo it was 100th the concentration of 1% that was effective and considered a placebo they found that it's effective but atropine is dose dependent and so are its side effects so 0.01% is acceptable not scientific evidence in fact right on q we now have a low dose concentration available which is 0.05% which is showing it's more effective than 0.01 and has equal side effects or very less and there is this huge puzzling disconnect 0.01% atropine slows refractive changes but does not slow abnormal eye enlargement any myopia control must slow the rate of eye elongation because that is the cause of side effects in pathologies later life at present this just reduces the power of glasses no long term safety in fact this recent viewpoint has has very aptly put that despite evidence that it is not showing eye elongation reduction it is being rapidly adapted in clinical practice and widely used which is both unfortunate and concerning it is completely harmless as dr arun said we just don't know how it works it acts through some receptors but then what are those receptors for which we are blocking there are no side effects today but remember we need to put these drugs at least for 2 years in growing developing eyes 2 years daily 60 seconds left 12 year old children one year just to see efficacy plus the rebound effect so rapid myopia occurs the moment you stop atropine drops is this the best available treatment my biggest objection is that it diverts attention from alternate and proven effective treatment outdoor activity multiple studies have shown more than 2 hours of outdoor activity definitely and significantly reduces progression soft multifocal contact lenses are now fda approved for control of myopia ortho keratology other drugs like pirenzepine seven methylxanthine timolol all have shown effect these are the alternatives and this graph of atropine that you're seeing is all the doses that you have and you have a lot of alternatives and so i leave you with this photograph of keep myopia away go outdoors and play is the slogan from singapore where atropine came out and it's not go use atropine please show your aggressive behavior in educating the patient giving all the options encouraging outdoor activity which is actually free treatment and good for the general health and don't blind thank a child you, bind a child years with treatment that is yet to prove itself thank you very much wow great rohit sir for sharing your uh, lightning and fast uh, points so arun sir you want to make any comments to save yourself please Yes, I, I have already told that he has considered defect. So when he said that uh, two years of uh, treatment is necessary, the Atom two study is a five-year study. So they had two years of atropine followed by one year of uh, washout period, and if there is a progression, they used to use it for another two years. So it's a five-year study, and they have already done this study. And regarding the environmental factors, I also in, uh, emphasize that environmental factors are important. Uh, it should be a multi-pronged approach. It's not that uh, atropine is the only uh, treatment for myopia. So it should be a multi-pronged approach. But atropine definitely offers a ray of hope uh, for these children. Otherwise, uh, we used to see like uh, uh, what I have uh, quoted the figures: nine point five percent of uh, those patients are going to become high myopes. And Dr. Srinivas Joshi will have a lot of work because he will have a lot of retinal detachments coming to him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you are combating points, Rohit Bos. so i i just reiterate the key problem is uh, elongation of the eye which as of now 0.01 has not proven to show that it arrests elongation of the eye it may arrest the refractive error moderately but the key problem is the myopic retinopathy and retinal changes and the risk of rd which it will not affect if it does not uh, limit the elongation so at the moment it is a drug that is under study and we still need a lot of lot many questions answered 
before we start giving this drug to our the growing eyes of our children because we don't know what's going to happen 10 20 years down the line when we block these receptors when the eyes are growing so i think a lot of caution is necessary and it's a misplaced aggression probably driven by a lot of hype and pharmacological uh, you know push by a lot of companies that are marketing it thank you <laughs> and uh, i think both of the opponents rest their case and uh, now we will leave it to the judge actually the, both the opponents need not be really scared because he is uh, one of the most diplomatic and ever smiling personality of the judge we have is none other than dr gaurav luthra and i'm sure he will do justice uh, and <laughs> you know this time i'm caught because you know both both people have spoken so well i'm i'm in a quandary you know they both make their point so well and um, uh, frankly uh, i have been following this debate not just now but over the last few years on you know to see what the verdict final verdict is going to be uh yet i feel that um, you know i think uh, both made their point really well and that finally is the answer to this debate i think uh what first of all what rohit said about you know spending time with each child and each patient you know counseling the parents the child and each time on their visit counseling about outdoor time all those things are so so important and i personally believe in that as well But yet so i think lifestyle modification advice everything counseling all that is probably the first line of action which we should all be doing atropine should not be the first line of action anyway yet there will be that small subgroup of patients where in spite of everything you notice that you know things are not going the way that you want parents are really concerned they are trying their best they are educated they've been trying to kind of you know do everything that they can do right and yet you notice and then you know we have done uh, put some of those kids on atropine and yes we have seen a couple of patients over the last 2 3 years who have you know probably you know i don't know whether it it's placebo effect or whatever it is it does seem to work in those handful of patients where we've tried it so i definitely will and then rohit also mentioned about the few other uh, you know areas which we could work on i'm sure that you know there are lots of ways to work on and atropine is just one of them in india i don't think the pharma pressure is that big because atropine thankfully in india is really cheap yet yet uh, i think uh, we should keep our minds open to all the things which are possible and um, i i think that's what sums it up that yes uh, we should not close the door on atropine either and in some cases where it does work and i i think a lot of new studies are going to tell us more about this this way or that so i think aims is uh, should lead the way and you know conduct a full study on this with a huge group of uh, children that would really answer this question even better in the long term uh thank you thank you gaurav sir uh, i am as i said definitely he did uh, justice to both of you all and uh, also to the panelists and the audience thank you very much so thank let, you. i think it's the time for the last debate and i should congratulate dr chitra madam and whole arc team as of i have attended most of these aios webinars i think this is the most time going webinar just 10 minutes left and and all the delegates are still watching very interestingly very intuitive talks are going on over to dr chitra madam a uh, great talk uh, dr rohit and dr arun there was always a learning in these debates too the last team to meet head on is a equally important topic of concern more so in this corona times pg education program we have with us a very endearing and popular teacher from allahabad dr kamal ji to acknowledge that the present day pg program is adequate as against our ever dynamic dr minakshi swaminathan who took to uh, who headed the post graduate education at shankar netralaya and i know she has led it to great heights and she would post strong points on why she wants to revamp the system so we have a thing or two to learn in this uh, debate so let's hear what dr kamaljeet has to say on to you doctor thank you dr chitra and uh, happy birthday srinivas thank you uh, it's really great to be amongst the top most speakers in the world <laughs> and uh, it has been on time so i was waiting since long but it's well on time so i am so much impressed by the um, panelist and the chairman of this uh, debate and also thanks to sunil also for keeping up the time yeah sunil has done wonderful job yes that's all Uh, regular uh, presentation is going on there is no interruption you can do it on your time dr kamal ji get to your yeah time. yeah 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 <laughs> so the training program is governed by mci post visit uh, regulation of the 2000 year and 
what is our goal the goal is to produce competent established uh, specialists who are expected to master most of the competencies and uh, if you look at the te techniques of training you will find that uh, it remains the same it does not change since long and when a uh, student comes to us to do ms ophthalmology he has already done his mbbs and perhaps i think that he has wasted 6 years of his youth in learning the art which he has to unlearn later when they join they know nothing about ophthalmology there is not much of uh, teaching in ophthalmology in mbbs the whole uh, course lies uh, in the interest of the medicine and the surgery and gynecs so the process of unlearning begins from the day they join the uh, post graduation so first we make them specialists and then they have to be made super specialists they so they first they learn uh, what they have learned in uh, mbbs and then they unlearn what they have learned in ms ophthalmology and become super specialists methods remain the same mostly we have to ask our students to go to opd wards and do refractions seminars general discussion only problem that i feel is the research and didactic lectures the teachers in the department they don't take uh, lectures usually it is the other way around that the um, residents teach the teachers so didactic lectures are very important that is not there and statistics is missing because we don't teach much of statistics they have to do research work and it many a time they fail in that so i went through several uh, literature and i found that uh, what is the goal of this the you have to train them surgical training academic training and you have to make them a good teacher also so these goals have to be achieved and uh, further i went through the literature and i found several very good articles on this pg education and uh, i found that uh, the shortcoming that is there is the that they don't assist it in the posterior segment procedures corneal surgeries laser surgeries that is not available in most of the medical colleges and therefore they lack in these uh, specialties so this calls for a serious introspection by the authority to allow such institutes to keep them uh, to keep uh, the training at a par so that they learn a lot on, in various subjects of the ophthalmology so there are fellowships after that you learn cataract refractive surgery glaucoma retina and pediatric ophthalmology and oculoplastic so that also comes up and uh, in the year 2006 when i gave uh, my presidential address i said that it's cataractology cataractology and cataractology and it is still the holds true the training program has not changed at all and what about the trainers they are not trained what i learned about 30 years back I, if i am interested i go to various conferences and then learn and otherwise i have a uh, lack of knowledge and there are so much of exposure of new gadgets is required that many a times trainers fail so there is explosion of new information which is very very essential for the teachers to learn and there is no program for trainers so my submission here is that uh, this debate is not for just the opposition it is for the constructive suggestions and uh, and okay not just for the sake of opposing and we have to reach to some solution and it should not be futile debate like we have in parliament so basic problem is infrastructure that has to be developed and whether the instruments are functional or not all these uh, surgeries can be learned if you have a good infrastructure which is not available there syllabus remains the same whatever you want to teach you can teach only these equipment even these basic equipments are not there in many of the medical colleges so the infrastructure is more important than anything journals are very few in the library although you get these online these days and uh, students are more interested in learning the surgery rather than publishing things and uh, publication is just for the promotions of the consultants wet lab facilities are very poor mode of um, this thing need of the r is a structured uh, review of the training program and it should be always regulated peer reviewed and uh, there are modules Thanks, available in ico and nbe also so you can always look at that and finish up that 
my proposal is that uh, you have to teach them how to well, do a good spectral business contact lenses financial support should be there a good clinical setup and you look at the mbas they they work for two uh, two years only and they think of making an industry and what we think of is a opening a small shop close to the barber shop so that all that should be changed and uh, i would say that uh, dr minakshi would agree with me and we can come to some conclusion later thank you thank you dr kamal ji dr minakshi we look forward to your recent thoughts i think dr kamal ji has made it a debate a rather one sided win for you dr minakshi yes i'm right here Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, a very happy birthday, Srinivas. And uh, uh, Chitra, thank you so much for this uh, kind invitation. And a wonderful program. I've enjoyed all the debates so far. So much to learn how to debate, how to elegantly debate. Very proud to have so many Shankar uh, Nitralaya alumni as part of the program. Um, okay. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Kamaljit, there's already. said that my topic is the valid one so really i'm not going to spend too much time but just for fun since it is the last uh, uh, debate i just thought it'll make it a bit fun so all stories in this presentation are the result of only my imagination i give dr chitra complete credit for the self discovery of my uh, hidden talent any resemblance to real life situation is scary as hell oh worthy opponent yeah. i offer my argument <laughs> So it was somewhere in an Indian PG residency program, second year PG. Good morning, ma'am. I want to discuss our curriculum with you, ma'am. Next three months, I'm posted in glaucoma, ma'am. Ma'am, curriculum, curriculum. Who put this idea in your head? That SR. I am your thesis guide and internals also for the exam. What early morning creating complications? PG. Oh, sorry, ma'am. I just wanted to know what I should cover. Um, sorry, one second, ma'am. I don't know. Huh? Go block the next case. Two years later, she has finished MS, but she is called Doctor Missed It. Patient comes in into the clinic. She says, "He." A patient says, "Good evening. I went to two doctors, and they found two different powers. So I wanted to get it checked uh, by you, doctor." and then doctor uh, missed it says uh, my technician is on leave i can do by computer method uh, hey hey turn that switch on da and uh, dust that uh, that machine no and then patient says doctor but you yourself cannot check and then uh, doctor says you know what a technician will come you come <laughs> back next week and in another part of our great country this is doctor dnb do not bother patient good morning today i took leave and brought my child she has quint and maybe vision is also less she is only 3 years old dr dnb is now scratching the head uh, how to check this brat uh, you do one thing no hurry you come when she can read uh, all that abc and all uh, patient says but but you know what i googled it and uh, they said that i should not uh, delay uh, dnb okay okay uh, we will put some drops and we'll do something last scenario i promise this is dr do don't know patient uh comes and says i just got transferred to the bank here i was told before i came that i will need laser treatment to prevent some pressure attack and uh, dr do says sir sir that is very advanced treatment i i will have to send you to the main branch patient but but sir that is 300 kilometers away now i am not joking where is the evidence for this kind of scenario happening this is the read study this was published in the igo in 2017 it stands for residency evaluation and adherence design study basically they polled young ophthalmologists post graduates who were finishing their residency program and asked them hey how was your clinical training how was the teaching how was the surgical training these are the results and you will be scared to see what the results are just a second here is a list of all the procedures that they are supposed to know and if you look refraction 
on a confidence rate uh, scale of 0 to 10 five as you come down look down 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 pediatric visual acuity testing two retinal lasers one gag iridotomy three and somewhere there gonioscopy also is a poor six now why are we fussing about this is it really that important it is important because what is the prevalence of diabetes in our country 77 million that is the number we are looking at what is the prevalence of angle closure glaucoma various studies have said various things but it can be even up to 4.3 percent our pg does not know how to do gonioscopy does not know, know how to do laser iridotomy what about uh, refractive errors 6.1 percent no no pg doesn't know to do refraction what about uh, visual impairment in children most important cause is refractive error pg doesn't know how to examine children so santosh wrote very nicely in his tutorial ophthalmology residency training in india covardis should we look at the american style acgme accreditation guidelines oh we don't have time for that kind of detailed documents okay so maybe you should be look at uh, the iso residency curriculum you know it says international but really i was part of the iso residency curriculum it's really very western in nature so really what do we need what do we need is an india centric curriculum and dr grover very eloquently in his article outlines it in 2018 and this was followed up by this publication on national curriculum for ophthalmology residency training i was even wondering is this an important topic and i found on pubmed that indian postgraduate residency curriculum in the last five years there are 20 publications you don't talk about this unless it's important so do we need to change without a doubt it's about time otherwise you'll get doctors from university of google and university of youtube who will be treating us in the future thank you so much dr chitra thank you very much that was a very informative talk by both of you uh, but is there any need for a rebuttal it seems both of you are on the same thought process that we need to revamp the whole process i wish as leaders and of in fact i think that you are you uh, i was going to say you dr chitra and the leaders of the ai voice you have to be the events of change. you have to be the bringers of change you have to be the angels of change who need to bring change to our ailing postgraduate system no better than uh, you people that's my appeal i think dr kamaljit agrees with me that's our combined appeal to you thank you so much for bringing this to light thank you very much dr kamaljit any thoughts yeah us should uh, talk to the government of india and mci and see that the infrastructure is uh, available and uh, because of lack of because all the postgraduates are equally intelligent and they can do all the jobs that they do after their ms to learn and uh, they do in their fellowship so if this infrastructure is there all of us can learn all the things and i know that the stalwarts sitting here they have not done any fellowship my pal uh, had gone yeah, for my pal had gone for cornea and uh, but he is doing all refractive surgeries all, all eye wells except for yeah, it has everything gaurav has not done any fellowship and they are doing all the best that is feasible and they have learned during the course uh, in the later years and, so it's not essential that we have to go in for fellowship only thing is infrastructure is lacking which should be improved thank you thank you very much Dr. Devashish, your final words on this? Yeah, I think this is a very serious area and uh, we really need to look at it. I think uh, the other thing, uh, as Professor Kamajit said, infrastructure in our uh, government medical colleges and private medical colleges, I find that the patients are very inadequate. I mean, they, uh, infrastructurally, they may be a little more up to date. But uh, having said that, you know, the entire environment, when one thing goes wrong, a lot of things uh, uh, follow it. So essentially, I think what the PGs lack now, nowadays is they are not, uh, the interest in ophthalmology has, uh, is not created, which is our lacunae, uh, which we have to create the, their interest in ophthalmology. And uh, of course, they need to learn, but uh, they need to 
learn, uh, create that interest in ophthalmology. And unless the infrastructure is there, then it really doesn't happen. I mean, they, from the first day, they probably start uh, thinking that, you know, I will learn cataract surgery and uh, by doing as many cataracts as I can, because wet lab facilities are not available. So they don't put the rigor that is uh, required to go through the wet labs before they really expose themselves operating on a human eye. They, um, you know, all complement or, you know, discomplement each other. So yes, I think AIOS, everybody of us should take uh, this part very seriously because uh, the future is losing very critical time as Dr. Minakshi pointed out. I think uh, the fellowship uh, uh, is as also uh, Kamaljit said that it, uh, Professor Kamaljit is making the point very right that, you know, why should somebody require a fellowship? Of course, you know, if he's doing something uh, ahead, but for a basic ophthalmic practice, I think an MS should be competent enough to go and start practicing. So all this said, I think uh, we should really focus and all of us so that, you know, the content of uh, these students and their interest in ophthalmology, the ethics, um, these things should be put very right. Debashish, the unfortunate, this is Himanshu. I, yes. I totally agree with this. is a very important debate. Very, it's not a debate, actually. It's a monologue. Unfortunately, yes. the, the, the postgraduates are at a loss. They have not even done five cataracts. And, and there's so much of sadism existing in the whole system. I think there's a lot of rot existing. And that needs to be looked at very strongly. Fellowship is like, it is your, your postgraduate three years is a waste of life most often than not. It's very unfortunate. And prime years of life of most of these students is at stake. So it's very important, more than the rest of the whole debate that we have had, this is the most important point conveyed in this. True, true. So, but, uh, 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 Manchu, I'll just want to make a point. Actually, you can't pray, uh, you can't paint uh, all the postgraduate curriculums with the same brush. Uh, there is a lot of diversity. That is what we need to attack. Uh, it is not that uh, what I learned in post-graduation in All India Institute of Medical Sciences and Dr. Kamaljit uh, doing a senior residency is like doing a fellowship actually. Uh, and what I did in senior residency, whatever I am today, I would say that I would owe it totally to uh, what I learned, the skill set that I learned in All India Institute of Medical okay. Sciences. That's the teachers. The only thing that is problematic is that there is a significant thrust from the government to increase the number of seats. That is the only thing that they are wanting to show it on paper that the number of seats have gone up, say when we were doing MBBS, uh, maybe 10,000 seats now, 75,000 or 80,000 a year, whatever. So the number of seats have been increased without caring for the standards to be maintained. So there is a dilution of standards there is also a dilution of the lack of faculty uh, who is teaching in the colleges there. So, uh, unfortunately, what you said, sadism, I would say, yes, there is a problem. It is not sadistic. I would say it's an insecurity. Whenever a person does not want to teach is when a person is insecure himself or herself. So normally we have heard stories, which is true that the slit lamp binoculars were kept in the almaras by the people when we were this thing and you won't even allow a resident to have a look from the slit lamp or you are not allowed to use one particular microscope or you are not allowed to. It is a sense of insecurity because they don't, I would be most happy if my student becomes better than me because then I have achieved what I wanted to achieve that the student has become uh, better than uh, what the teacher is. Unfortunately, it is the mindset of people not having enough and trying to be very protective of what they have as teachers and not opening it up to the others. That is the unfortunate, the lack of facilities of uh, people, uh, of institutions not having equipment of institutions not having great teachers. That is the main problem. That is uh, that is the bugbear. And I remember Dr. Kamaljit came to us uh, in All India Institute when there was a program called Train the Trainers. So where uh, ECC IOL was trained in uh, this thing. So I think those kind of things have to be done. 
and whatever uh, aios can do the problem is the infrastructure even uh, despite the covid i don't think the government is going to significantly change the amount of gdp that is going to be spent on health and until of course there is a thrust of gdp spending on uh, healthcare you see any government institution they would not have any equipment and if they have equipment or technology it is out of order for reasons which could be uh, it could be malicious or it could be uh, motivated by somebody whatever it is so the finances also yeah, i know both either it is yeah. not there or it is there it is not working so that is the problem so it is a very very big problem where until of course healthcare is given primacy uh, you your quality of people who will be coming out would be very poor so that is uh, a big big challenge that we have and i think uh, as you rightly said there it's no it's a monologue actually we are all together in it and it's one voice that we have to say that uh, the post graduate uh, teaching and training has to be improved and that's one thing i also say against uh, sics that people are trained for sics in big institutions and they are not taught feco deliberately it is that they have to come back for fellowship and Please then don't say deliberately dr maypal Okay. we uh, at rio we have uh, three machines and there are 150 surgeries going on so that the workload is, is so much kamal ji that is not a problem the machines are easily available what i am just trying to say is okay i may not use a strong word at that so so the point is that we have to have openness as regards what we are teaching to our fellows or to our post graduates that's all the uh, the thing has to have a significant overhaul there has to be a uniformity in the curriculum and oski etc whatever you are doing across the board like dnb has across the board the same exam it's much difficult to pass a dnb exam than it is to pass a md ms exam uh, in uh, peripheral college so i think lot of work has to be done and i think we are all together in it and we should uh, try to push uh, the betterment of the post graduates and the teaching and the learning abilities that they have just one point i would like to make uh, here that one professor today is allowed three candidates for matlab he has to see the thesis of three students three students in one year means that for three years he has nine residents with him so it has become so difficult as you have rightly said that the mci is uh, just increasing the number of seats of course, yeah. not bothering as to how would the training would go absolutely uh, i have a just a last point rohit rohit bhai pal sir yes what i wanted to put in a bit of introduction what i wanted to just say was that i agree all these things are big issues but when i was doing mbbs we had a lot of mbbs doctors practicing as gps today mbbs is what bsc was in my time you are a graduate but you cannot get a job you are not employable this is what is happening to our post graduates they are post graduates but nobody is going to give them because we are projecting speciality so strongly that that the post graduate is started thinking that i may become a post graduate but i cannot practice ophthalmology i am i i just don't know anything i need to be a senior a complete senior residency in rp center or a fellowship in one of the places without that label patient will not come to me doctors will say that who is this guy this guy doesn't know refractive surgery he is doing cataract so he doesn't know refractive he doesn't know cataract he is not a specialist how are you going to him that's the that's the huge mental oh, pressure oh, our post graduates are under and that's why they do so of refractive surgery they cannot even do a, a good fellowship person who has done fellowship in retina cannot do a good refraction so many a times amlapia in amlapia they keep on searching for oct and angiographies and oct angiographies so that too is the other way round if you yeah. look at that that is also yeah i'm just saying the flip side the other side also that you know we need everything so super specialized that yeah. there is a constant pressure to get better and better train better train better so that's again you I, make a better post graduate you let give him the confidence that he can practice and do a good job great just a few so words i mean uh, you know we have always i think the message that comes across is that uh, we are going for quantity and quality is being compromised we have been talking about it for many years uh, ashok grower was very passionate about it i think if it comes to it it's uh, aos which has to make a difference i mean i think we have the where with all the power the respect that needs to be done and it's most important as was pointed out there's a wide variation between the quality of uh, post graduate program that's offered and some of them come out well equipped some of them are very poorly equipped even after a fellowship they are not 
you are good enough to handle anything if only we can get some kind of a curriculum some kind of a process there in place which is followed all across not only at the post graduate level but also at the fellowship level we did have a program with the ico there is an entire curriculum that's available for every fellowship program that needs to be conducted across the country i am not sure that anybody is aware of it at all to my mind maybe this segment is the most important segment of the entire proceedings of the evening there is something comes out of this usefully i think that would be a great step forward i think it's up to you my part to take this forward with the help of uh, mr vaidya all, all of us yeah all of us uh, i think i just want to make one point uh, mypal sir and uh, kamaljeet sir minakshi madam when you said so in karnataka uh, in la last year back we started something called as karnataka ophthalmic teachers academy i think kp had turned the term that coin so what we did here is see a lot of things differences are going on between the dnb as well as the ms medical colleges some of them say in dnb you learn more practical but not theory and and in the ms they say you learn more theory and more not more practical so what we thought was to bridge the differences and uh, in fact it was so spectacular that all the teachers took it so positively and we got a call from the rajiv gandhi university which is one of the uh, biggest universities of healthcare in india uh, especially in karnataka that do you want any changes in the curriculum in the post graduation i think these are the things if we can make and make the certain changes as minakshi madam said i think that will benefit both ms as well as dnb's uh, uh, education to a large extent so oh, i'll call you in 10 15 uh, ma'am can i make a small suggestion if it's okay yeah go yeah. ahead ma'am yeah uh, actually uh, i mean uh, just a small suggestion that see, if at all we are trying to say okay we have to accomplish a, uh, a surgeon completely well equipped after post graduate i would say is like i feel over the years the first two years they have to find the student what is he, what is his interest so that in the final year they can give a little more emphasis on that so because what happens is uh, in a in a college it becomes a little more giving a little more difficult to give everyone a chance in everything sometimes it becomes challenging especially in the final year so if they can in the first two years if they can you know uh, ask, uh, see the, how the student is doing how better he's doing if his interest is more in cataract or more in refractive more in retina in the final year maybe they can give him a little more cases on that maybe you know uh, tweak his uh, skills a little bit in the in the final year and i i believe uh, you see how we have uh, a theoretical uh, assessment of how good the student is i feel practically all the i mean surgically also we need to have some kind of an assessment so the surgeon once he finish i mean uh, the student when he finishes the surgery there's some kind of a grading of how his skills is uh, at the end of the pg so that it's more clearly uh, it's more clear that whether he requires a fellowship after that or not so with the grading itself you know the even the private institutes will be happy to see look at the grade and say okay he's a very good uh, skills uh, from pg itself we can take him up so i think as far as the pg mindset is concerned it's extremely, extremely important to make sure they understand is ophthalmology is not cataract surgery i have kids uh, my own kids studying doing uh, post graduate residency they only counted by the number of uh, sics that they have done so obviously there is a whole life ahead of them for, to learn cataract surgery is extremely important they drive home the message that they have a comprehensive exposure to ophthalmology as a whole and it's not equated just with the number of cataract surgeries that they do that is why in my arguments uh, dr ramurthy i did not uh, talk about surgery at all we have to talk about basic skills like gonioscopy we have to talk about refraction which most people really cannot do anymore we don't have that many good optometrists to support us either or pediatric vision examination these are all very important skills that many programs do not impart yes dr k sir, sir we have been talking about the problem i think uh, just like i want to add to shrinivas talking about the solution in karnataka as he told we have what is called kota karnataka ophthalmology teachers academy which is basically a loosely bound organization where every organization every in teaching institute is loosely bound and we it is basically a self governed thing the idea here is see why we have enough resources among the institutions enough you know opportunities for all our students to learn things like shankar netralya has lot of facilities we don't have so we have probably collaborate so it's basically in an in a, in a state the institution don't come together for a common cause because of either self interest or disinterest or maybe egos or maybe technical issues 
if we can bridge all the institution with a single cause of patient i mean pg welfare as a common cause i think we have lot of strengths to share our weaknesses can be taken care i think what quota in karnataka probably is just i mean it's going is going on very well so i think this can probably be an example which can be emulated in other places where each institution as you said uh, some institutions have some uh, strengths and others have some strengths so we can probably come together and take care of our weaknesses i think this can be one way of looking at it in fact the the university was uh, perplexed that they started asking us that do you want any changes in the curriculum and uh, i think the, these kind of approaches if we change and make it at the state level uh, i think it it would be a really a good rationale to update the pg curriculum we so also we wanted also have to a... have a primer course for all the students who join that year in that uh, state the institutions will chip in their uh, resource persons will have a five day primer course for people who join ophthalmology so that they will get all the basic training in the priming of the before they start the pg something like that so the all these things are possible probably if we come together dr uh, chitra can i say one minute and then can can i also have my say yeah i think everybody is understood i mean we are, everybody is on the same line but i just wanted to add two things one is that the concept of senior residency as dr maipal said was very good you know rather than fellowship a senior residency gives a chance to you know work in the area that you would like to work for example you might get posted in retina if you like retina or if you, so once you've done a pg you get much wider exposure so come out as a comprehensive ophthalmologist at the end of pg aios can play a big role in setting up the curriculums and bridging that gap second thing i wanted to say was that a few years back uh, ARC used to have accredited AIS accredited fellowship or something similar kind of a program where you know participating institutions without monetary benefits really would be accredited for imparting small uh, post uh, MS fellowship programs where they were qualified or you know they were like uh, uh, kind of recognized for doing that we could revive something like that so to fill in the gaps of what is missing from the pg teaching programs in some places because every place will not be able to come up to that level as we aspire even if ai steps in and then the mci steps in we could kind of do this kind of a small six months or a one year thing where people could post ms you know they could be facilitated to go to a small accredited program without being expensive or, or anything and then arc could play a big role there so i i thought i'd chip in with that already in the pipeline very valuable suggestion gaurav i uh, we need to come to an end to this webinar but there have been lot of things which were discussed here i think the first step would be like each of us who have a post graduate training program in our own places should go back and do some kind of a, a self retrospection and see how best we could improve and that may be those smaller steps which would take us to larger steps and as an arc we should see what we could do a small bit towards this very major problem which exists it has been a, a, a fantastic two hours i'm sure it's not something which i felt alone each of the speakers gave so much of energy and just to the whole program and there was so much of scientific content and it was not nothing very superficial either so thank you very much dear speakers for putting your life and soul into giving the best talk each of you did the best and of course a very energetic expert panel who definitely ironed out the final take home messages thanks to one and all of you for the impressive fight you took on a very special thanks to mr nikhil from entor and his entire team for sponsoring all our arc webinars a special thanks to airs kripal his team and of course mr sunil for endless webinar they have ensured a special thanks to numerotech and sai for being the support system for arc and my very own very dear arc team for their strength and backing which they have given me at every single turn and every single event uh, hippy pure a special thanks finally to our dear dear attendees who have been loyal and consistent and have been a very just source of encouragement for us hope you all enjoyed it and i hope we do meet you again in some of our webinars ahead thank you very much look forward to seeing you all in many more of our arc programs of future thank you one and all of you thank you thank you thank you to you too thank you wonderful thank program thank you thank you madam thank you thank you thank you madam for thank the you. opportunity thank you ma'am thank you Thank you. Thank you. Good night, ma'am. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy birthday, Srinivas, sir. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.